but take Mike dropped off. <laughs> no, he's having issues. Oh, there he is. He's back. Recording. Sorry about that, everybody. Okay, we're back. I apologize for that. Uh, we will Councilman Hill lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to, to the, the flag of the United, United States, States of America, of America and to the Republic Republic for which it stands, one nation, one nation under God's will, indivisible. Thank you. And Sue is on. Sue, would you do us a favor of uh, taking attendance tonight? Yes, uh, Councillor Biggs? Present. Councillor Forrest? Present. Councillor Hill? Here. Councillor Lesser? Councillor O'Connor? Here. Councillor Pelletier? Here. Councillor Pentelo? Um, okay, he, he's here. I'll have to mark him in. Uh, Deputy Mayor Mazzarella? Here. And Mayor Rell. Here. Thank you. Thank you, Sue. And uh, if I can just uh, do a reminder for folks, uh, please speak yourself when you're not speaking. And what we can do is um, if you need to speak at any time, uh, please raise your hand. Or if I don't catch you or the town manager doesn't catch you, uh, just speak up and say you got a question for um, the presenter. Um, but we do have folks uh, on tonight from the town's EDIC uh, to hear a presentation uh, from the DOT. Uh, as many of us know, the uh, pre uh, President Biden administration and the Congress and the uh, U.S. Senate has uh, approved some infrastructure funding uh, that will be coming to all the states. Connecticut is included in that, and uh, we should be receiving some funds um, on the municipal side from the governor's budget office. Um, I believe that goes through uh, each of the uh, agencies, and DOT is one of those agencies, and Weathersfield uh, is a beneficiary of a number of uh, projects slated in our town, or some that could be uh, slated in our town. Uh, so I would like to turn this over to uh, Kimberly Lassay from DOT to kind of give us an update on and maybe a rundown of what some of those projects and use of funds could be for. And uh, if anybody has any questions for her, please let us know. Mayor uh thank you so much. Thanks for having me here uh, tonight and certainly I'm going to attempt to boil down uh, what we know from the over 2,700 pages of the Infrastructure Improvement and Jobs Act um, into a few minutes. Um, hopefully it's helpful. Um, let me see. Get started here. Share my screen. If everyone is seeing. Yes, yep, can't mark that. Uh -huh. All right, great. Okay, um, so uh, again, trying to boil down um, an, an awful lot of, of information for you. Um, for those of you who might have uh, listened in or seen uh, Deputy Commissioner Ucolito's cost presentation, uh, some of these slides um, may look uh, familiar indeed. Um, I, I did steal that as a base, but I'm hopefully gonna give you um, a little bit of different information, some additional information, um, some additional resources, uh, try to include links in here. Um, and certainly will we'll help out wherever I can. Um, we are still digesting and still awaiting some guidance on many of these programs and grant opportunities. Um, so many of my answers to questions tonight might be, uh, we don't quite know yet, but I'll do my best uh, to try to walk you through this. 
Um, so if you're not familiar with the Infrastructure Improvement and Jobs Act, uh, that is now known as the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, um, it was passed by uh, President Biden uh, last November, um, signed, signed into law. Overall, nationwide, this is a $1.2 trillion bill that includes uh, $550 billion of new federal spending over five years above uh, baseline spending levels. Uh, the new spending includes dollars um, for non-transportation infrastructure, as you mentioned, Mayor Rell, um, and includes um, monies for things such as broadband, drinking water, wastewater systems, electrical, electric grid improvements. Um, but there is quite a bit of that spending uh, that is transportation focused. Of course, that'll be my focus tonight. Um, so again, on the transportation side, this is a five-year surface transportation reauthorization bill. Um, what, what that really means is this is not uh, some the stimulus program that maybe some folks might remember years ago um, called ARA, which was truly kind of a, an additional funding uh, that came through. This is our reauthorization. This uh, replenishes our coffers uh, for programs that are already planned to be underway and that we rely on on a regular basis. However, there is obviously uh, additional money, which we're very excited about, um, and there are some new programs. So I'm gonna go over some of the new programs um, and then also um, over the grant opportunities, um, which, are, which are pretty different. Um, so again, uh, this is not necessarily a shovel-ready stimulus program, um, but it, it does need $5.38 billion in formula-based funding over five years, which is a $1.62 billion increase over our last reauthorization, which was the FAST Act back in 2015, and does provide for over $100 billion in grant opportunities across the nation. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so this is just a, a really quick rundown of some of the new program funding um, that we are expended, expecting in pro program, um, actual program, so the bridge program, EV charging program, carbon reduction program, um, and a program called PROTECT, um, which is a very, very long acronym that basically is steered towards uh, resiliency um, for infrastructure. <clears throat> Um, I'm going to give you some resources here, um, some links. Um, if you haven't seen it yet, uh, FHWA does have a very helpful bipartisan infrastructure law website. Um, there are also fact sheets that are, that are available on each program that's coming out. Um, and there's also, I've included here, a link to what's called Federal Aid, Aid Essentials for Local Public Agencies. Um, if all of this is sounding very foreign to you, um, and you'd really just like a 101 on how to navigate things like federal aid programs, financing, uh, rights away, the requirements that we have um, under environmental regulations, civil rights, um, project construction and contract administration on the federal level um, for any projects that you're thinking um, about for these federal programs. This is a great place to start. Um, they're quick little videos. Um, they're, they're very helpful. And uh, they're, they're just a great introduction to some of the basics. <laughs> um, switching gears quickly to grants. Um, again, we're expecting 100 billion um, to be available nationwide. Of course, these are competitive. Um, there's 25 competitive infrastructure uh, funding opportunities coming up. Again, not all of them DOT. Um, many of them that may also be of interest to all of you um, at the town level. Um, will be coming out through the Department of Energy. Um, some are new, um, and again, some are continuation of existing grant programs. Um, so some of the new ones um, that I'm really excited about, and I would be excited about if I were in, in your shoes, um, and I'll dive into this one in a little bit um, on another slide, is the new Safe Streets um, and Roads for All grant program. Um, there's also a new Reconnecting Communities grants are coming out. Um, a rural transportation grant, Weathersfield, probably not going to fall uh, within um, eligibility for that one. Um, but new bridge grants coming out um, and a new mega project grants, uh, those will be through DRT. Um, and then raise grants and infra grants, uh, if you're familiar um, with any of those, um, those are ongoing continuations of those grant programs. Um, all of these differ in some allocation, um, and that means who will be eligible recipients, um, the criteria for selection as well. 
um, as when they will be open for applications. Um, a few more um, that are coming up. There's many on the rail and bus side. Um, there is a new culvert um, grant opportunity coming up. Um, and the EV charging is a mix of formula funding and um, available grant funding. Um, and so we're still awaiting um, some final uh, guidance um, on many of these. Um, but as you can see, many will focus on combating climate change, providing multimodal choices um, to travelers, um, safety, job creation. Um, and if you've been watching, um, kind of reading the tea leaves from the Biden administration, you can certainly see um, that there's prioritization um, for improvements in low income uh, underserved communities. Um, so, you know, my overall advice, and it sounds super simple, but it's not easy when, when you go down to it, is you want to start thinking about your needs in Miners Field and how you might be able to match um, these up with the various up upcoming opportunities. Um, work with your neighboring towns and with your council government um, MPOs um, on strategy as far as which ones to go after. Um, the getting to the timing, I mentioned that all of these will differ in their timing. The ones that are coming up first in this first quarter of 2022 um, are the raise grants and the infra grants, which again are continuations of grant programs that have been around for a while. Um, the, the notice of funding opportunity or the NOFO as we call it, the raise grants is actually out right now. Um, and that is coming up due, I believe it is um, on April 14th. Um, and infra, infra grants are also coming up um, this first quarter. Um, looking ahead, the Reconnecting Communities grant, uh, it looks like it's gonna be open in the second quarter. Um, I've given you some links here um, to some of these grant opportunities, um, but also um, in general, this fact sheet over to the right, there's a link there. Um, and this is a, a nice little overview of all of the different um, grant opportunities that are coming up. There are some active links in there that will take you right to the website for those specific ones. Again, um, some, we just kind of have the description um, that's in the Arts and Infrastructure Law, and there's not really guidance out on them yet, but you can get a general idea of where these um, different programs will be focusing. I promised that I would, um, excuse me, talk a little bit about Safe Streets and Roads for All. Um, the actual guidance is now not out on this yet, but what we do know is that this is going to be a $5 billion competitive grant um, through the Department of Transportation, um, that's USDOT, and it will provide funding directly to and exclusively for local governments um, to support any efforts to advance Vision Zero plans and other complete street improvements to reduce crashes and fatalities, um, especially for cyclists and pedestrians. Um, so, you know, from some of the questions that I saw um, ahead of tonight's meeting, I think that this will be um, one of particular interest um, for you. I know that um, we're especially interested. We've been um, very dismayed um, during uh, COVID, during the pandemic, to see an increase in our fatalities across, across the state. Um, and that includes, unfortunately, um, increase in pedestrian and bicycle fatalities. Um, so uh, this is certainly a focus within the department. And uh, this Safe Streets and Roads for All is definitely a grant opportunity um, to check out um, for, for your town. Um, and if you're interested in some of the work that's going on with our Vision Zero Council um, at Connecticut DOT, I also provided a couple of links here. Um, we do have our next meeting on that coming up on March 22nd. Um, coming up, uh, I believe that this one's also going to be more in the second quarter of 2022 is the Rural Surface Transportation Grant. Again, probably not a big one for Letters Field uh, because you are more in the um, more heavily populated um, area. Um, but this is this is another one just to keep an eye on. Again, um, until we see the actual um, criteria, um, we don't have all the details on all these programs yet. Um, just to talk a little bit about some of our other programs that are ongoing at the Connecticut Department of Transportation, um, aside from what is going on with uh, the bipartisan infrastructure law, um, I thought that these might be of interest to you. Um, our community connectivity program um, provides construction funding for local initiatives and is focused on improving accommodations for um, bikes and heads, both in urban, suburban, and rural community centers. Um, <coughs> excuse me. 
Um, the goal is to really make conditions safer and more accommodating for um, pedestrians and bicyclists and encouraging people to use sustainable modes of travel. Um, I've included a couple uh, link here to the actual program. We just, um, we just announced our uh, latest round of uh, additional funding on this, um, but this is a great one to keep an eye on and to consider um, for some of your ideas in the future. <clears throat> if you are not familiar with some of our other um, local funding programs, um, these are some that might be of, of interest to you and um, to check out. I've included links um, to our websites um, and to information. Um, the State Local Bridge Program um, is, is a program uh, for uh, local bridges. Um, our LOTSIP program, <clears throat> our, which is our local transportation capital improvement program, has been around for a while, um, and that um, is coordinated through the council governments. Town aid road grants um, come through um, with, with, the, um, with, with our bonding each year. Um, oops, sorry, skips ahead too quickly. Um, and um, our CMAC, uh, which is our Congestion Mitigation Air Quality uh, Program, um, is, is another one that um, many towns take advantage of. Um, we just finished up a solicitation on that, um, but certainly be on the lookout for our next solicitation um, for that program. It's another great one for towns to keep an eye on. Um, we will be launching a new rural local um, transportation improvement program. Uh, we're going to be calling it TRIP. Um, we're still working out the details of this. This will also um, be um, administered with the help of the Texas government, um, as lots of is today. <laughs> so um, again, um, just, just mentioning uh, to work with CROG, many of these programs, the way to get to them and to get to the funding is working through them, uh, also a great opportunity um, to work with, with some of your uh, neighboring towns um, through them. And, uh, actually, the uh, banner here is the actual link to their website if you do not have that. And as far as just kind of final thoughts, um, all of this may sound um, you know, a little bit obvious, and I apologize if it does, but um, I would definitely love to Prioritize your needs um, and, and look at kind of a project pipeline. Um, look at where you think um, what you want to do might line up with some of these programs, um, make a matrix. Honestly, that's what we're doing at the Department of Transportation on a very, uh, on a very large scale. Um, see where you think you're going to match up with the criteria and where you might have your best chance um, you know, for a win for some of these grant projects. Um, you know, for, for projects that are going to utilize program um, funding, you, want, you need to ensure that those projects are part of your MPO's um, transportation improvement plan or TIP. Um, there's certainly things you can do um, to ensure that you've gathered information, start to have you know, you know, more than just a concept, understand um, what would your goal be of these? How can you write a grant application that will be hitting all those keywords that they're looking for um, with the criteria? Um, and definitely look to you know establish those relationships um, with the uh, you know with the agencies that are going to be um, working um, on these programs with you. Um, is is just a great place to start. So I'm hoping that this was helpful. Um, again, there's an awful lot here. We we'll probably talk about any program uh, for for quite a while, and um, but certainly I'd uh, be happy to take any any questions. Great. Thank you, Kimberly. Um, very informative. Um, any questions for Kimberly on these projects? Councilman Hill. Uh, thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Kim, for uh, that information. That was extremely helpful. Um, just one kind of general question I'm sure you get a lot is, what can uh, the town do to kind of position itself for not only the funding that's rolling down to the town, but any of the grant opportunities that we may be eligible for. I, I know you said not everything has to be quote unquote shovel ready, but what can we do to kind of expedite the process to make sure that we're not leaving money on the table? No, it's a, it's a great question. And again, as, as more criteria and more guidance rolls out for each of these programs, I think you'll know more. 
um, again, you know, not to want to over oversimplify or understate um, what kind of an effort it is, but I think it's really looking at, you know, what are your needs, what are your priorities in town, um, you know, do you have some some studies that kind of got started, you know, didn't get traction, um, you know, can they can they be dusted off, um, you know, that. Studies get get tricky because if they get too old, right? The question becomes: Are they, are they really valid? Are you know are your existing conditions up to date? You know how much has changed? Um, but you know certainly looking at um, you know again those communities where perhaps um, folks are either a, a zero um, zero automobile household or reliant on transit, or are there um, first mile last mile connections? Um, do you have some areas um, within town or that can connect to your neighboring towns that are a little bit more um, low income that are disadvantaged in some way as far as transportation opportunities? Um, do you have, um, you know, jobs, you know, job centers that people might be trying to get to? I, I think those would be things that I'd be sitting down with my, with my planners, my town engineers and and uh, you know, getting as many people together to kind of brainstorm as to what do you see as, as your vision for the town, as your vision working with some of the surrounding towns, get those down on paper and start lining them up of where do you think that you know you could you could be a best fit? And, and certainly um, for whoever is your contact with your cogs, um, you know, be attending those meetings regularly, um, meet with them, you know, and we'd be, you know, we'd be happy to to you know help with that in any way. Um, if you need to make some additional connections there. That's helpful, thank you. You're welcome. We have a um, just one train track that goes kind of through the, the center of town. And there have been some concerns about uh, flooding because of culverts being blocked. And I know there's, there's two separate um, grant programs, one for rail and one for culverts. Now, would the company that operates the rail line, would they apply for funding for the rail improvements to their rails, or would that be something that we could apply for um, either through the rail uh, grant program or through the culvert program to clean up that area to ensure that, you know, those, the flooding doesn't occur? What would be the best pool for that? Yeah, Mayor, that, that's a, a really good question. And you're thinking along the right lines. Um, you know, one of the first ones that comes to mind is what we call the BRIC, the BRIC program. Um, that, that stands for Building Resilient Infrastructure and Communities Program. That's an existing program through FEMA. Um, that might be a helpful avenue. As far as who would apply, that's a tricky one. Uh, freight, especially freight rail. Um, sometimes you know, operated by a different operator than by who actually owns the property. So that's, you know, you're on the right track there of asking the right questions of who would actually be the applicant there. Um, but a lot of these can be, um, can be community-based. Um, but uh, again, you saw there are quite a few um, both program funding and grant funding opportunities coming out that have to do with, with flooding, uh, with climate change, um, there's, I'm just looking uh, in this, uh, the, the papers that I'm referencing, referencing right now um, are that link that I showed you on that slide uh, from, from the White House. Um, there's a flood mitigation assistance program that's also going to be coming out from FEMA. Um, that looks like it's going to be later in the year, um, but um, looks like maybe early fall. Um, but that might be um, a good one to check out. And again, um, that's in that that's in that link that I provided um, on one of the slides. Those just are the ones that really quickly come to mind. Um, but certainly, um, something like flood alleviation. There's also going to be um, a, an entire increase in a program um, for at grade railroad crossings. Um, I'm just you know really kind of scratching the surface here tonight with some of the things that are out there. Um, so if you have a need in town that I didn't happen to mention, um, I, I would say don't let that stop you from putting it on your list um, okay. because there are there are a lot more lot more opportunities out there. Great. And then I had a question about almost on the similar line is the Silstein Highway and the Berlin Turnpike. Those are both state roads. 
Um, but, uh, you know, the town, obviously, they're, they're within Weathersfield. Uh, any improvements on either of those that would it be the DOT that would be looking at um, a larger grant for those or would the town look at something for improvements on those two particular roads? So with those being state roads, uh, those would be ones that, uh, you know, would really have to come in, you know, with coordination through the department. Um, I did have um, a couple conversations um, with your town, with Bonnie, your town manager, about how to get that started. You know, we're certainly open to um, with meeting with you and talking in particular about that. Um, I, th I think you certainly have a lot of opportunities on the Silas Dean. Um, the Berlin Turnpike, uh, I'll be honest, is tricky. That's a challenge. Uh, you know, you've got a lot of guide rail there. You have an awful lot of curb cuts there. Um, and that one's a challenge. But um, I believe that you had an older study that was done quite a while ago along the Silas Dean. And again, that might be one of those that you dust off, you know, see um, how accurate are your existing conditions. Um, is there, you know, a certain section of that that you'd like to concentrate on? Um, and again, uh, the Krog, I think, is, is a great place to start with some of those ideas. Um, but we'd be more than happy to, you know, to talk in specifically about those and the whole process of getting things into um, our queue and becoming a project. Um, it, it's, it's a process, um, but um, it, it's something that we're, we're more than willing to, to discuss and help you with. I, I think we see some opportunities on the Silas Dean as well. I'll just mention, um, if, if none of you have already checked out uh, the Greater Hartford Mobility Study, um, I think that that's something that i um, love for you to check out, be involved. Um, we'd love to hear feedback from you. That's looking at um, transportation, um, not just in Hartford, um, but, but looking um, at, you know, at, at that whole Hartford region. So that's also a great opportunity if you see needs um, that, that might be linked um, to, to have your voice heard there as well. Okay, thank you. Um, any other questions from council members before I open up? Councilman Forrest. Um, Kimberly, thank you for coming in. Are you, when we talk about an ongoing conversation about the South Scene Highway, are you the liaison for that broader conversation about many aspects of that road um, that probably touch a lot of different departments of the DOT, including utilities and, um, or is it somebody else? Like, how does, who's the conduit that we have a comprehensive or able to have a comprehensive conversation with the DOT about that road? It's a good question and it's a tricky one. Um, my official position is I'm the Bureau Chief of Policy and Planning. So we're, we're certainly part of that you know, planning process. We have a unit um, that is dedicated to coordinating with the COGS. It's called our COG Coordination Unit. Um, really a good place to start there is, is, with, the, is with the Capital Region Council of Governments um, and start, start with them. Um, but, but again, my understanding is you did have a master plan that was done, I think, quite a few years ago. Um, I don't think that it got a lot of traction, um, but I will tell you that um, the outlook on sidewalks and safety improvements has changed um, pretty dramatically since that last study was done. Um, and I don't know what kind of coordination was done with the club, um, but we'd be, we'd be happy to work with you on that. I can, I can be the beginning of a point of contact to get a meeting set up uh, to get the right people in the room, um, but it probably won't be me on a daily basis. Not that I wouldn't like to, like, to, uh, like to do that, but it probably won't be me myself, but I can certainly help get you in touch with the right people. Do you have any idea who that point of contact would be at the DOT, you know, as you? It would, it, it's gonna be multiple people. Um, and, you know, it's probably, it's certainly going to be somebody from our COG coordination unit um, that is assigned to the COG um, or perhaps someone from our, you know, from our strategic planning and projects. I don't, um, I don't know where the last study went, but I would, I would be looking to, to dust off where you left off there. Um, Mary Beth Wojewski is our assistant director um, that heads up our COG, um, COG coordination unit. Um, and Dave Elder is another great point of contact um, as well. Thank you, okay. Kim. Appreciate those uh, points of contact. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else? So I think I did see Derek Greger on 
the um, call or on the Zoom. So, you know, these are conversations that we're going to have to definitely have with our engineering department um, to get this priority list. Um, I don't know if there are any projects that are on this that are um, also included in the um, the CIP program or the CIAC, but you know there could be some cross reference to these grants to what we are also looking at for CIAC. So um, you know maybe we'll have that conversation with those folks as well. And I know Derek um, is our point of contact with the departments for that. Um, I do have EDIC members on this call as well. And I do see Cindy Jacobs, you had your hand up. Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, um, I just wanna mention that um, the EDIC uh, Economic Imp uh, Development Improvement uh, Commission um, has a subgroup, um, the Silestine uh, Highway Improvement uh, Subcommittee. And uh, we're very interested in uh, having some kind of um, functional and safety improvements and aesthetic improvements um, for our uh, major uh, commercial district and thoroughfare. So I'm just really pleased that you're here. Thank you very much for spending time with us and for uh, to the um, uh, town council uh, for setting aside time for this uh, Q&A and information sharing. So uh, I'll just uh, move forward with the questions that I have. Uh, one question I have is, I guess I've heard that um, a lot of towns have already gotten all their studies up and you know they're ready to go. And I heard something about a website crashing just because there's so many so uh, so many proposals in. And I'm just uh, wondering what the timing is for this. Um, and we're still trying to uh, formulate what uh, what we want um, and what we can do. So that was one question and there's kind of a related one, but if you want to go ahead and kind of give us a, an idea of what, what the time frame is for submitting proposals. So I can try again, that's going to differ uh, for every one of the different um, grant opportunities. Uh, the only one that we have seen open so far, as far as the NOFO being open again is the raise grants. Um, so as far as the website crashing, um, that's possible, but I haven't heard that as of yet. Um, but uh, they are coming out all at different times. And again, we're, we're only tracking the Department of Transportation ones. So again, the ones that are coming out this first quarter of 2022 are the RAGE grants. Um, there's a Port Infrastructure Development Grant. That doesn't, that's not going to apply to you in Weathersfield. Um, there's, again, um, the, the infra grants are, are due to come out in the first quarter of 2022. Um, safe streets and roads for all. Again, one I think that is going to be um, of particular interest uh, for a lot of, a lot of towns. Um, we're expecting applications to be open for that in May of 2022. Um, there's an awful lot of back and forth going on right now with EV charging and fueling infrastructure grants. Um, there, there were seeking comments earlier in the year. Um, and so again, waiting for more guidance to come out on that. Um, but there's other things that, you know, may be of interest outside of transportation. Um, there's a clean school bus program that's expected out later this spring. Again, that will not be through DOT. Um, that, that's a competitive grant program um, uh, through EPA. Um, reconnecting communities is another one that might be uh, really exciting for everyone. And that's expected out in the second quarter. Um, and uh, again, the rural surface transportation grant is opening this first quarter. Um, but with my understanding of your census data, that's probably not going to be one that Weathersfield is, is going to be able to be eligible for. So again, trying to match up your eligibility, but the timing is different for every single one of them. Um, so I know that doesn't make it easy, but we're going through the same process at, at um, Connecticut DOT and just, again, making matrices of what's due when um, so that we can have projects lined up as well. Um, and then, you know, definitely communication will be key. Um, wouldn't want to have two neighboring towns putting in for something really similar. You know, maybe you can join forces and have something that, you know, works for everyone. Um, you certainly don't want to be competing with your own MPO. Um, and, you know, we certainly don't want to be competing with anyone either. So, you know, we're already talking about ways that we can be sure to be communicating um, so that whoever's going for grants has the best chance. 
Thank you. That's helpful. So we, we still have time to get our proposal yes. together. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Race, race sure. grants are the only ones that I am aware of that are open so far. Okay. And if I could just have the, uh, the time a, a little bit more, um, but uh, you've, um, thanks to Matt, you, you've, uh, Matthew, have, you have, uh, we have points of contact. Would that be our first step in the process? I'm just trying to understand, uh, no pun intended, kind of what the roadmap is, how we move forward in, um, you, you know, uh, getting our proposal and to whom do we, I mean, as a state highway, we would need cooperation and coordination with Connecticut DOT. So we wouldn't want to do anything to surprise you. We would want to work uh -huh. together with you folks. So tell us where that is in the process. Yeah, so, so again, um, my recommendation has been to have a separate meeting around that. I would uh, strongly recommend that the CROG um, uh, members, um, you know, at least from, from transportation planning, um, I believe for CROG, I think it's Roger Cron um, and um, Kara Americans. I'm sorry, there's, there's nine COGS that I have to remember the names for, but I think that those uh, are, are the folks um, that are transportation planners at CROG. Um, again, more than happy to set up a meeting um, with them. And, and if you want to get some names to me, and I can get um, at least the right people um, to the table at DOT and get you started, um, I, can, I can help with that. Um, but I would start with sitting down um, with the crowd and taking a look at, at where you left off um, and what, where you think um, that proposal is going to fit in uh, with, with the region as far as, as, far as a, you know, a priority. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else from EDIC with any questions for Kimberly? And my final one is the connectivity um, grants, the community co connectivity. Uh, here in Weathersfield, we've done a lot of work in old Weathersfield, um, both uh, pedestrian walking and safety improvements um, is what we've done separate already what we've done already separate from whatever grants may be coming forthcoming from um, this uh, infrastructure pro project or program so mayor just trying to understand your question is your question along the lines of if you've already received funding for certain pieces would you still be eligible for for funding for others is is that right line of the question most certainly um you know especially if you can show that you're filling in a final gap um some of those final gaps are sometimes the trickiest there's usually three that's usually why they're the final ones um is, is that they're a little bit um, more challenging um but um the community connectivity grant program again um provides construction monies um so if you have you know have have a design um that this is something where um if, if you apply um, and, and are you know and are successful um, that that is competitive we do screen those um, at condot in house um, but uh, that that would that is an avenue to have construction monies which sometimes is, is really helpful um, for, for many of the towns to know that at least you would have construction money um, so I as long as I mean you can pair different you know different funding sources together as well um, where you need to. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else? Any questions? Otherwise, no, it was very informative. We appreciate that. And uh, uh, we look forward to uh, working with uh, you and bureau chiefs or anybody else from DOT to start uh, prioritizing some of our projects and um, working with DOT on some of the state projects that we could uh, um, either piggyback off of or uh, work standalone on. Yeah, we're, we're excited as well and uh, appreciate this opportunity and I will send a copy of the PowerPoint um, along uh, via email uh, for all of you and again don't, don't hesitate to reach out. Um, email is the best way uh, to reach me and um, again thanks for having me and uh, best of luck and ho hoping that we can uh, work together to have some great improvements. Great, thank you. Thank you, everyone. And Bonnie, Derek, I got to maybe if we can put that PowerPoint from Kimberly on uh, the town website to share with 
the residents. I know there were a number of uh, links and uh, she had mentioned one in particular with videos on um, success stories as well as, you know, programs that can uh, be funded for the, you know, to get that up on the website for the residents to be able to, to interact with them. Great. Yep, we'll be glad to, Mayor. Okay, moving on. Um, I don't have to see any questions. We go to, um, we have no hearings tonight. So we'll just go right down to public comment. And uh, I think if we've got anybody in the queue. Uh, yes, we have um, area code 860-563-6923, if you care to speak. I got one request of our EDIC chairman, Mark Trahan. If you can mute yourself, can you do that? We're getting a little feedback. There we go. Thank you. Uh, I'm sorry, Bonnie. The um, phone number again? Five eight six zero five six three six nine two three. And they have to hit star six to unmute. Oh yes, I'm sorry. Okay, I'm back, right? Yes. Okay. Um, uh, the the presentation that was just given by the DOT. Person. Mr. Young, can I just interrupt you real quick? Sure. Uh, just state name and address for the record, please. Robert Young, 20 Copper Mill Road. Thank you. Um, the presentation that was just given by Kimberly was quite interesting, but it also confirms and reinforces what I've said in the past regarding the COVID and the monies that have flowed into all the states across this country. Uh, what an easy way to create hysteria by our government in order to push money out into the communities to do what? Buy votes. And that's what it's all about, is about buying votes and, and, and showing how great our government is. But all the while, folks, look at our inflation rate, and it's caused by this. I mean, there's a lot of things that cause inflation, but one of the things is all this free money flowing in and being created. There's nothing to back it up except for what we have in the bank, and now there's more dollars floating out there making what we have in the bank, all of us, and that includes all you sitting there on this council, and, and, and it just becomes worth less, and that's what we've done or our government has done. They have lessened the value of our money. And, and what a shame that they did. Um, and look how hungry the communities are to get this money. Whereas before you had to do grants, you had, you had to apply for, the, uh, apply for money and, and, and play all their games. And now it's so easy, you're sitting back and, and because a whole bunch of people got sick and the government created hysteria throughout this country and around the world. We're just flowing with money. Oh, well, I guess that's how our government works. Uh, what I'd like to talk to, uh, to you tonight about, and, I, and I've talked to you in the past about the same subject, and yet there's no response. You've got a big response coming out for all this free money. But uh, when it comes for you to try to make some money, you're very silent on the issue. And, you know, I've talked about the Keisha Farm more than once. I've talked to you about creating a 55-year-old-plus community at that property. And I've, and, I've, and I've tried to explain that you could create a number of building lots. And the, the, being very conservative, you have a 32-acre property. You have about five acres that is wetlands, unbuildable, leaving you 27, acre, or 27 acres to build on. And if you put four 55-year-old, 50, I should say uh, a community of 50 uh, that's only allowing 55 years and over 
people to buy in. That way there you have no expenses or very little expenses. You would get approximately 108 units on that piece of property. And as, we, as I've discussed with you in the past, and I've shown you other kinds of units in other communities right nearby, within a few miles of the Keisha farm, you know, they, they, they generate about $10,000 in taxes per year. And if you had 100 and, 108 of them, you would generate approximately a million, over a million dollars per year in added taxes. And if, if you had put 108 units on that same property and they sell, these homes sell for $400,000 each, you would bring in an increase of, of 43, $43 million in sales. And, and, and that would add approximately $30 million to the green list. It creates a ripple effect that benefits the town greatly. And over the course of years, you'd be collecting for perpetuity a grand amount of money compared to what you're, what's being suggested by your Keisha Farm Commission. Um, consider also, by doing such a community, what you will do to the local community in that neighborhood. You'll increase the value of all the homes, which end up paying, as they get calculated on their grand list, they'd end up paying more taxes. Uh, so I think you would end up having a ripple effect by putting in a nice community. Now, how many times has the town of Wethersfield and all towns helped and led the way for a private developer to develop a piece of property? and make money. You even give you even lead the way for giving them tax abatements for five years to do something on a piece of property and make money. But what are you doing with this piece of property besides nothing? You're not doing anything. I have suggested in the past, Mayor, do a schematic. You have the tools in, in town hall, in your engineering department, to where you can do a schematic of that piece of property and show how many building lots you will really yield on those 27 acres. And then you can give a, a, a review, like you're giving, a, giving this uh, a Kimberly tonight a chance to review. You could give a review as what you could do with the Keisha farm that would put money in the pockets of the town taxpayers. Well, we thank you, Mr. Young. Yes, we yes thank I you. understand. Yep. And I'll that continue. Ongoing. So we will be reviewing a lot of things that uh, they, uh, they uh, study uh, will be forthcoming. And uh, I'm sure there will be some um, projects that uh, they're interested in. But uh, we hear that the public has... Uh, some concerns and some ideas themselves. So we do appreciate your comments. Mayor, there are no other phone numbers, but there may be others on um, that may want to speak. So I don't know whether you, you know you want to ask if anybody else does. Sure. Yep. And there are members of the public and there are still members of the EDIC on uh, this Zoom. So if anybody wants to speak during this first five minute public comment section, please do. If not, we'll continue on with the agenda. Okay, any council reports from council members? Deputy Mayor Mazzarella. Yes, uh, last week we had planning and zoning uh, approved the Institute for Cosmetology. We got that right. Um, at uh, the Rite Aid building uh, near the corner of uh, Wells and South Steen Highway. A very attractive uh, plan that they presented. Um, they they uh, train approximately 75 students a year to uh, uh, 
and they'll be moving their facility eventually from across the street to this much larger facility and allow them to uh, bring more students in, have more space between the students. And uh, like I said, very attractive plan. They also are participating in our facade improvement program. So uh, they'll be using uh, some of those funds, hopefully to uh, um, really dress up that section of the Silestine Highway. So we're looking forward to that. Uh, that was all I had. Thank you. Any other councilmen with uh, council reports? Councilwoman Pelletier. Uh, I attended the Youth Advisory Board meeting on February 10th. Um, we were presented with the results from the survey that went out to all the middle and high school students <coughs> regarding um, mental health issues, behavioral things, and um, uh, like substance use and abuse. Um, and that data is actually going to be coming uh, to be presented to the council at our next meeting in early March. Um, so the we hope coalition is going to be you know taking a deeper dive into the data and um, using it to come up with some programs to um, help uh, the youth with uh, substance abuse issues and you know how to prevent substance abuse among our youth so um oh and then the other thing is the um the youth advisory board scholarship the applications are now out and um should be at the high school for any uh, seniors graduating uh, this year who are Weathersfield residents. That's all. Great. Thank you. And let me just see. Anybody else with any council reports? Seeing none, uh, we'll move over to uh, item C. Council, uh, Councilman comments, anybody, any comments tonight? And if I can't see you, just Mr. Deputy Mayor. Yeah, if I could, Mike, thank you. Um, so we're entering the uh, budget preparation season and I just wanted to throw out a couple of comments uh, regarding the state of our town finances. Uh, this will be my third budget that I'll be working on. Um, prior to that, um, it was pretty much common knowledge that our town struggles to come up with enough revenue to support all the needs and wants of, of the residents. And uh, it's been said that it's not a sustainable system. We just don't have enough business and industry uh, to help offset the tax burden. Um, I would like to see something along the lines of some kind of strategic plan or uh, meeting of the minds, think tank type thing where we come up with possible solutions of, of this tax burden that we can't get around. Um, in the last two, three years, the only one that I've heard was from Councillor Forrest who suggested a possible uh, endowment type uh, plan of, of increasing our, our revenues. Um, I don't have any answers, but we, we need to come up with some long range solutions for either increasing our revenue stream or becoming more efficient and reducing our spending. It's, that's the bottom line. Uh, you go year after year trying to, trying to make things work and you know we're kind of kicking the can down the road. So I was curious if there was any way we could use any of this ARPA funds to do a study on something like that. Get some, get some outside help in to, uh, to possibly advise us or, or make suggestions of what we might do to, to improve our financial position. Don't want to sound like doom and gloom, but it's, uh, you know, we're, we're entering this budget process and everybody's going to come up with 
we've already come up with huge requirements for all this ARPA money. It's like these requirements came out of the sky. So, and you know, we're tasked with cutting. That's what we have to do. We have to balance the budget and someone's gonna lose, something's gonna lose. So I just hope everybody would keep that in mind as we move forward with our budget. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Any other comments at all? Well, um, I just want to mention that, um, you know, throughout the pandemic, we've gone from in-person to Zoom, back to in-person, back to Zoom. Uh, I am happy to report that uh, our numbers have gone down substantially from when we started Zoom, uh, I think back in December if I'm not mistaken. And uh, this will be our last Zoom meeting. We will be back in person uh, for the first meeting of March. Um, just prior to that meeting, uh, the mask mandate from the state on students, uh, I know we're not the Board of Ed, but um, that mandate is going to be lifted on February 28th. And um, I think I talked to our town manager about mask requirements. We, while we don't have a mask requirement or a mandate town-wide, we do have it for town buildings. And it, you know, suffice to say that, uh, you know, if we're going to do that for the schools, then there would be no mask requirement for uh, within town hall. Um, and then we will work with each of the boards and commissions to see if they want to go back to in-person meetings. I know some members of some boards and commissions um, can want to continue with uh, Zoom, but um, you know it will be a prerogative of the the majority of the boards and commissions to go back in person uh, after um, March first. Um, I don't know if the town manager had anything. I don't think I'm surprising you with uh, uh, anything there. We knew that February 28th was coming, so. Um, we should uh, lift the uh, mass requirement in town hall uh, as well. Obviously, you know, we keep an eye on what's going on and if numbers change, we'll take the direction from uh, the state and state agencies like Department of Public Health, our own central health district, and obviously the SDE when it comes to schools. Um, but for right now, um, we'll continue this path to uh, um, slowly get us back to normal. Mayor. Yes. Councilman Forrest. Thank you. <clears throat> Just to two items. The first is really to Bonnie. I've been noticing uh, at the intersection where the railroad tracks come through the, the cross streets, whether it's Maine or church, uh, that as happens after three or four years, because there's two different sort of paving projects for each property, it's deteriorating to a point where it's becoming a problem for cars to go over. So if you could maybe just have uh, somebody look into that, that'd be great. I know, okay. that, you know that in the past, whether it was eight or 10 years ago that you did a phenomenal job and they came in within a week and took care of business and helped us out. Second thing is related to the deputy mayor's comment, obviously, or I mean, not obviously, but about a year and a half ago, this council actually passed in a bipartisan way the creation of that um, committee to tackle those issues. And we even had a bipartisan deal to, to who would be on that committee, but it needs the appointment of the mayor. And that has not happened in a year and a half. So what we'll do is uh, taking the lead from the deputy mayor, we'll talk, I'll talk to the leadership, we'll talk to you guys, and we'll put up to uh, the individuals to, uh, to be on that committee and we'll get it moving forward, deputy mayor, all right? So that's a good way for all of us to work together. I know we've got a lot of good projects. We're going to have a vote, I think, coming up soon where we work together in a very successful way. And there's a lot of, um, there's a lot, there's so much more that we all agree upon than we disagree. I stand by that. Yes, I agree. And Councilman Forrest, we will work. I know you had reached out to me a while back and said, we got to get that off the ground with the uh, endowment uh, committee. So um i'll brush off my notes and see the appointments and uh and get that going 
and maybe, yeah, we'll work on with um, Bonnie. We can sit down and, and discuss that as well with uh, Councilman Forrest. Okay. Uh, town manager's report. Uh, just quickly, as you mentioned, the mask mandate will be um, lifted in town hall as of Monday. Um, on the 11th of February, our numbers were, oh, what did I do with them? 43 per 100,000. Last Friday, it was 26. So definitely going down. We're still in the red, but we're getting there. So um, that'll happen on Monday. And then, as you said, the, I'll tell the department heads tomorrow, but boards and commissions can make their own decision whether they're going to stick with Zoom or go live. And then um, just that my budget reviews start uh, Friday. So it's that time of the year, fun time. So thank you, Bonnie. And I, I think you heard from Deputy Mayor you know, yes. that we always find ourselves in going into the budget. Yes, uh, Weathersfield is very built up. Um, commercial is, uh, is not as robust as other towns. Uh, we rely heavily on the uh, property taxes, residential property taxes, and motor vehicle property taxes. And we saw it with our grand list that uh, despite the fact that we did go up in our grand list, uh, it, you know, it, it does not reflect the true cost of government going up and, you know, cost of, like Mr. Young had said, inflation, uh, cost of services, healthcare, salary increases. Um, we are uh, getting to that tipping point where revenues uh, are not meeting the expenditures. So um, we will be having these conversations going forward and, uh, you know, we look it's actually a pretty good idea to think about uh, a study. Um, I know CCM has been grappling with that over the years. The legislature has been grappling with that over the years. You know, and, and here's one where they're actually thinking of capping the mill rate on motor vehicles and what the effect that would have on municipalities uh, to wait and see. We just hope that it's not unfunded and uh, um, we are left ha um, you know, having to fill holes. So, Mayor, if I may ask one follow-up question. Sure. Thank you. This is in regards to the, the lifting of the mandate for, for town facilities. Um, is Mr. Browner from the health district, um, because we're technically still in the red, does he need to kind of weigh in? Um, my con I guess my concern is more is on the general liability for the town that we, we don't have an exposure there if we lift the liability, that, I'm sorry, the mandate and we're still technically in red. I don't know if the metrics are, you know, we're still reliant on them or not. I just wanna make sure that, you know, we can move forward with that without, you know, I don't know if he's weighing in or not. He weighs in on us every Friday, Councilman Hill, and says, do not lift those mandates. Uh, Mr. Brown is extremely strong about that. And even when the numbers are not in the red, he feels we should have it. Um, but I, I know, let's put it this way too, um, less and less people are wearing them, but also our numbers in town hall of those getting COVID are much lower than they were. Um, but Charles will never answer the question about liability. That would be more of an insurance question. Okay. But I know uh, I'm sure you've read in the Harper Current and other papers all the other towns that are starting to lift them all too. So yeah, I, I mean, I, again, it's I just want to make sure we're just not exposing any legal liability or anything like that as we move forward. But I, I, and I, I understand Mr. Mr. Brown, that's his job. So I, I certainly appreciate that. Yeah, me too. And we'll ask all visitors to town hall and all staff to still be mindful of any um, uh, ways to mitigate. So I think, you know, I know in Sue Schroeder's office and the town clerk's office and other offices, there are barriers between public and, um, and staff as well. Staff, 
by this point knows that if they are not feeling well, um, obviously the first thing would be to, you know, not work. And, uh, you know, if it continues, there are rapid tests that are now available um, to test and uh, obviously come back positive, let the department heads know that way, you know, staff is ensured their safety and then those visiting such departments would be, you know, safe as well. So, but I do see both uh, Anthony Dignati and uh, Karen on as well. So they may be able to weigh in on any concerns that uh, we may have in town hall when it comes to uh, transmission. But I think everybody knows by now um, what steps they should take to not only ensure their own safety, but the safety of those that they work with and interact with from the public standpoint. Yeah, Mr. Mayor, I think you hit it right on the head. We, uh, we put a lot of effort in early on to make that town hall as safe as possible. Plexiglass, other safety precautions we put in, um, moving people away from each other, spacing out cubicles, things like that. So you know, I, I feel confident that the town hall is as safe as possible. There's very limited exposure, even for people that are coming into town hall um, because of those barriers. I, I'm pretty confident we can do it very safely and keep the numbers down. Thank you, Anthony. Okay, uh, Stu, town clerk, any communications, reports? Um, I have really nothing to report. Um, I just think the public is definitely ready to um, be taking off their masks when they come in. And we will try to, um, when we speak directly with somebody in close contact, we'll still be wearing our masks, I think, just as a precaution for the first little bit. But it seems like it's uh, probably a good time to start. Okay, thank you. Um, moving on to council action, I believe, I think we have uh, some appointments by the deputy mayor and then we had a walk-in appointment for ZBA for Councilman Forrest. Um, I'll turn it over to Mr. Deputy Mayor. Yes, I'll make a motion to appoint uh, two individuals to the Youth Advisory Board, Andrea Robinson, 57 Stillman Road, uh, and Gabe Zagaya, 19 Wildwood Road, both serving a term of 2-22-22 to 6-30-25. Second. Thank you. Um, motion has been made and seconded. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Ayes have it. Motion carries. And for the vacancy on the ZBA. Thanks, Mayor. Uh, I'd like to move Matthew uh, Tyzinski of 29 Woodland Street to fill uh, alternate to fill a vacancy on the Zoning Board of Appeals for a period of 22222. It's a fun number. To 63022. Well, Second. Motion has been made and seconded. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Ayes have it. Motion carries. And moving down to unfinished business. And this is something that we had been uh, working on, and uh, I think everybody had seen in their emails and in their inboxes some various changes. Uh, thank you to uh, Deputy Mayor Mazzarella, Councilman Forrest, Bonnie, our town manager for, for working on this and, um, and our town attorney for drafting a, a couple different versions. Uh, we've talked about this in the past. This came to our attention, uh, I think in late December, uh, some concerns about uh, operations of uh, how we operate our council meetings and um, you know it started off as a change from the workshops to a regular meeting uh, but as we started to delve deeper into the rules and procedures of our council meetings uh, we did want to put in some language for the ability to continue a partial hybrid version or a fully remote version. I know that uh, the governor's executive order from last year had been codified into law by the legislature 
and um, but we needed to do some cleanup language in our uh, own rules on how to handle um, meetings and everything that goes along with a meeting, whether it be virtual or in person, or if it is a combination of both. And uh, I don't know if uh, Deputy Mayor wants me to turn it over to him to kind of talk about some of the, the nuances, of it, but I think what we have before us in the most recent version um, it is what has been agreed upon and what we will have for a public hearing at the next meeting. Mayor, if you're going to discuss it, you need to take it oh. off the table. I wrote myself a note on that and <laughs> it's on my laptop. So yes, that was tabled from the last meeting, actually from the January 18th meeting. So um, can I get a motion to remove the rules and procedures changes off the table? So moved. moved by Councilman O'Connor. Is there a second? Was there a second? second. Oh, Councilman Hill second. Uh, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed nay. Ayes have it. Okay, now the uh, agenda item is properly before us. Mr. Deputy Mayor. Yeah, I just want to point out that the uh, the text that we'll be discussing tonight and moving forward was sent in a separate uh, email to all the counselors. We had a little bit of a technical glitch and we were focusing on this paragraph G and we managed to get paragraph G into the uh, agenda pack, but not the rest of the document. So Bonnie's been able to provide each of us with a copy of uh, what we're proposing that we move forward. Um, I worked with uh, um, Councilor Lesser and, and Matt Forrest and Attorney Slater. Um, I think we've pretty much satisfied everybody's concerns about uh, some of the wording uh, with the you know, working remotely, if, if an individual is unable to attend and they have to uh, uh, join our meeting uh, remotely, uh, put a, a lot of good um, lines in there that will cover us in different situations where a, a person might lose a connection during a vote, things of that nature. Um, Councilor Forrest brought up some real good points about, you know, the abilities of, uh, of calling in remotely and, and the problems that we might encounter. Um, so we relied on attorney Slater to keep us on uh, the right track as far as the legal requirements, mostly having to do with the freedom of information uh, requirements of, of holding a public meeting. So uh, I don't wanna go through all the changes, but the, the, the main change that we discussed in previous council meetings uh, had to do with this paragraph G about uh, participating remotely. Uh, if anybody has any specific questions, I'll try to answer them, but that's what we have. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Any questions on this change at all be presented to us today uh, in your email? And this will be uh, the one that is published for the public hearing. Seeing none. Okay. Um, is do we? Is there a motion on this one, or I just? I can make. I can make a motion if you like to uh, hold the public hearing on the changes to the rules of procedures as amended on Monday. March 7th, 2022, at 7 p.m. at the Wethersfield Town Council meeting. Second. Motion's been made and seconded. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 <laughs> Opposed, nay. Ayes have it. Thank you, and thank you again for uh, all your hard work, um, all the counselors on this. Um, I know there was a lot of back and forth uh, to clean it up as best we could. 
So with that, we look forward to the public hearing on the 7th. Moving forward, this uh, second item, item 2B, an unfinished business, uh, this was the one we discussed for the first time last uh, meeting. It is the um, concern that uh, a number of us had, um, and we've heard from both the chief as well as from residents on some of the aggressive uh, panhandling that is going on. Uh, many of our street corners, um, typically it's being seen on the Silestein Highway and the Berlin Turnpike in both medians and on the sidewalks and curbs. Um, so much so that I think uh, the day of our last meeting, uh, the chief had submitted a photo to uh, town manager that was shared to all of us, uh, almost a type of an encampment in one of the public transportation bus stops and bus shelters. Uh, this is a problem uh, that uh, not only weathers is affecting Weathersfield, but it's affecting our surrounding towns. Um, we did talk about the services that are provided by the town, social services, our food bank, as well as state services for them. Um, there is some uh, concerns that were brought up at the last meeting, and um, there are a couple towns that have ordinances in place already, uh, as well as, uh, you know, there are Connecticut general statutes that address some of the um, concerns that both the police and the residents have for these folks that are um, out there uh, endangering their own lives and endangering the safety of uh, residents and motorists alike. So um, with that, I think we're just going to keep it tabled for today and uh, continue working with this discussion. Uh, thank you, Councilman Forrest, and thank you, Councilwoman Pelletier for um, working towards this. Uh, I believe Attorney Slater has had some drafts presented before him as well as some uh, communication from municipalities across the nation that have implemented similar uh, ordinances. And um, we're just making sure that we can make it as clean as possible so that um, um, it does not adversely affect the town uh, but more importantly, it, it helps those that are out there uh, get the services that they need. Um, like I said, the town does offer um, services and we do have a uh, incredible staff at social services, social and youth services to help those folks. Um, and I also like to thank the generosity for the public and donations to the food bank, as well as gift cards and um, monetary contributions uh, they do go a long way helping those that are in need in our town. So, um, as I said, this is not something that we want to um, hurt anybody with fines or, or punishment, um, but we want to ensure that they are given the services that they need and, uh, and rightly so that they, uh, that they deserve. I don't know if anybody else has any comments on this. It's long-winded from me. I apologize for something that is being tabled, but uh, I did want to get that out. Councilman Forrest. Oh, Thanks, wait. Mayor. No, I think you did a nice overview, actually, and I'm looking forward to working with Mary. We've obviously worked in the past, and it's going to be, I, I think generally we, we have a, I don't think there's a lot of disagreement on, on the issues at hand, and I think we just have to craft a solution, which certainly doesn't open up liability to the town, but also is true to all of our laws, including the United States Constitution. But we're going to do that. We're going to figure out how to solve the problem. Um, and... Uh, in the process, I think we'll maybe we'll be a leader in sort of how to address this in a thoughtful, humane uh, way. Um, that said, I don't think this is something that's going to make take seven days to fix or 14 days to fix. This is going to be a little bit of back and forth. There's going to be some wordsmithing. I just want to try to set the expectations. I know that maybe, you know, we just set the agenda for, um, you know, some good work that we all did together. That probably took us about a month to sort of get through all that wordsmithing. I expect that this will be a similar, and it's not necessarily the next agenda. We're going to be ready to vote on, you know, three or four grand ordinances, but with some good diligent work, and you, you'll see if it, the, the work is progressing, uh, we'll, we're going to get there. But I, I sort of, my expectation is sort of 30 to 60 days probably to sort of get this whole thing together and then bounce it off of the, the counselors and the attorneys and stuff like that. And, and if we have to do a little bit more wordsmithing and it takes us 90 days, that's okay. 
but we'll get we'll get there sooner than later and we'll keep the ball moving forward thank you and i want to uh, just mention that you know there are some residents that um, have called in um, or emailed us and have told us that there's nothing that the, the town can do because there's there's no ordinance on the books and there's there's really any you know no um, no enforcement by the the police. Um, I didn't see Chief Medina on this. Zoom. No, he's he's not here. Okay, um, but I will ensure not only those on this Zoom but those listening and, and residents in the town that uh, yeah, you know there are statutes on the books right now that uh, if there is uh, aggressive panhandling or if there is a safety concern um, trespassing or any of those um, that can be enforced uh, right now you know please if, if there is a concern um, with anybody who is asking for um, food or, or money that uh, they become aggressive during that ask that there is, um, you know, the Weathersfield Police Department can address it and they, they do and they, uh, um, they will continue to do so. So it's not that, uh, you know, there's no recourse for, uh, for this. There is in our existing um, enforcement right now. Okay. Thank you. Moving on. So we'll continue to have that table. Um, can I go with the, the, the under on this and do 60 days and not 90 days? Can I hear a, a 30 days? My, uh, Mayor, you, you don't have to oh. technically, it's on the table. It's yep. so you, you, yep. Until we take it off, it can just stay there. Yep. So moving down to other business, this is the, um, what we were just, brought to our attention a little while ago when the uh, agenda came out. This is use of ARPA funds for the Everbridge Emergency Notification System. And it's one thing, I don't know if all council men on women on this Zoom get these, but you know we get them from the Department of Public Health for updates. Um, for obviously, you know, most recently it's been utilized during the COVID pandemic um, for, I think, Maybe it's just Department of Public Health. I don't know who else uses them, um, but we do get alerts from them. Um, I do see Karen and Anthony on uh, the Zoom tonight. I don't know if I want to turn it over to you guys first or if Bonnie, you had a-, a No, let's go right to Anthony or Karen. Okay, thank you. I'll start off um, just to give a quick overview, then we'll I'll turn it over to Karen. Karen right now is a user, part of the state system, so she's- uh, far more familiar with uh, how the system works and all the nuances. But basically the Everbridge is the mass notification system. Um, we chose the Everbridge brand because right now that's what CT Alert is. The, the Connecticut system uses Everbridge. So if we do purchase Everbridge, we would be partnering with the, with the Connecticut system. So um, once you opt into our program, you would also get the state notifications or the state information. Um, when the state does updates, they will also capture those folks that um, opt into either the state system or our system. Uh, so it'd be one giant system. Um, what we would be using if we're not so much for that emergency notification, because that comes from the state, the sil there's silver alerts, the amber alerts, the weather alerts, things like that. We would be using it for our internal and external information. Um, for more routine information. We have a lot of large public events, fireworks, holidays on Maine. We can send notifications out to the public about parking, um, times of the events, um, things like that. Um, one challenge, like you know, Mr. Mayor, we had with, um, with the COVID test kits, trying to reach everybody to make sure all the public knew about it. So once you opt into Everbridge, um, you can either have an app on your cell phone, you can receive even a landline call at your home. Um, if we were gonna have a program like that, we can advertise that in advance so we can reach as many people as possible. Um, another thing that the Everbridge system does, it can also tie in with our social media. So again, if we put a message on Everbridge, it would also go on to some of the Facebook and Instagram platforms. Um, and the, 
internal type of operation within town government. We can also use it for notifications um, for the employees. Um, I've been on the safety committee for the entire 12 to 13 years I've been here working for the town. And we've always had challenges about how do we notify everybody there's emergency. Obviously, if there's a fire in the building, we have fire alarms. There's other types of events where we may have to notify the employees that there's some type of issue. Um, this Everbridge system would, would have a, a desktop banner. So if somebody's working at their desk, we can push out a message. It would come right across their desktop so they can take the appropriate action. Um, especially when we had bad weather, if, if the town manager decides to um, close the town hall or close town buildings down, she can send one message out. All the employees can be notified. So it has 101 different um, options we can use to notify. Each department can have their own little system. So perfect example would be Parks and Recs for their programs. Or, um, they have to close down the pool for an emergency or something. They can send a mass notification. Um, senior services at the community center when they have their programs that they want to notify the folks there about those programs. They can send out messages so the folks would be um, notified. Social services food bank operations, things like that. So it, it, it really, it's pretty neat as far as how many people we could reach. So we, it's, it's almost endless the amount of town residents we can come in contact with to give them informa timely information when they need it most. Um, if we take advantage of this by the end of the month, I think Bonnie did send out the information to you. We also can take advantage of a 10% discount over the next three years. So, uh, if we can start that contract, um, you know, by the end of the month, we also have a nice little savings here for the community. Um, I'll turn it over to Karen. She can get some more highlights as far as the technical part of it, because again, she uses it right now as part of the state system. Thank you, Anthony. Thank you. So again, uh, 2009, we, uh, after we got Everbridge through the state of Connecticut and currently we use it strictly for emergencies to the resident for the residents of the town. Uh, we can use it internally for um, hiring officers, uh, getting information internally just for us in our police department as well as the Department of Health. They're also using Everbridge. Um, we understood there was a need with the safety committee identifying the internal use of it for our town hall, our, our employees for the town, as well as the town council, and externally for our residents, most importantly. Um, so in order to do a non-emergency notification, we would have to purchase this Everbridge Mass Notification Pro. Um, basically with this, how it would work is that the town would then make their own um, alert system logo that we could put on to our town website. And the resident would opt in to that, selecting what departments they would like to receive notifications from, whether it be physical services, uh, park and rec, the town manager, the town council, whatever they would like to see. And of course, our department heads will have training so they're not oversaturating, sending daily things. It wouldn't be anything like that. And the resident can change. They can subscribe and then not subscribe. But the beauty of this is the fact that this streamlines into Connecticut Alert. You know, most of us have opted into Connecticut Alert, but if you hadn't and you went through the town, what it is is that Everbridge every so many weeks to a month, we'll download that information into Connecticut Alerts, thereby being used for us in dispatch if there needs to be an emergency message or from emergency management, the town, that will be all in there that we can access and send it in. Not many people have landlines anymore, um, but the nice part of this is they can put in mul multiple devices and it can go up the chain, you know, they can go through their texts, to their phone calls, to their emails. Um, and just like Anthony stated, this information not only could be pushed through to the resident, it could be put on our websites and all our social media simultaneously. The nice part of having the non-emergency uh, portion of Everbridge is that when we have events, 
an example that Anthony brought up about the COVID kits, the testing kits, how nice it would have been that we created a, um, a, a platform that they can go to and they can sign saying, I'm registering that I'm going to be at this event. And then as the time went on and we ran out of kits, but we still had masks to hand out, we could have given out a blast to those that attended to say, we no longer have those kits, but please remain in line if you wish to pick up masks. And same thing for a holiday on Maine, same thing. If an emergency happens during it, again, those that are attending can register in. These are people that live from Enfield, from anywhere, Hartford. As they come into a town event, they register in. And then if there's any special instructions or emergency instructions, they will also receive it. So there is some really nice aspects for the non-emergency as well as it pushing into our emergency features by having Everbridge. I think in this day and age, communication is very important and it allows the residents to choose what they like to receive as a non-emergency um, communication and information that they would require. Just, uh, I think, you know, another example, Mr. Mayor, um, back on when we had that last snowstorm, I think Karen ended up working midnights, a parking ban was put in place. And I think we ended up towing, what, about 30 or 40 cars because people, you know, didn't see it. So if we put, you know, we put things like parking bans in place, we can send out a notification. That slowed down the snow plowing operation because, again, the snow plows have to drive around those cars. The police officers have to go out there find the owners either get the cars towed or removed. So again, when, it, when timely information needs to get out, this is a platform that works very, very well. Okay, thank you. Any questions from council women, councilors? Councilwoman Peltier. Thank you. Um, I wonder if uh, one of you can speak to privacy concerns. Um, I read through the attachments from Everbridge and in, it discusses, you know, pinpointing the location of users and um, being able to, you know, track where people are. Presumably this is for, you know, emergency situations, but I'm just as a citizen, you know, this is a, a government system that, you know, can track users and, and I just didn't know what kind of, um, you know, safeguards there are with regard to privacy and, you know, data collection and that type of thing. Well, I can tell you in the geo when we're trying um, sending out a communication, um, we can actually go in and just, we don't know who these individuals are, it's all by mapping. And when people go in and they put in their data, their information, they, you know, if they state that they're with Weathersfield or if they give a specific address, like for example, if you have a landline that has your address, and if I have an emergency in a certain area that I need to um, send out information saying I need you to shelter in place or I need you to evacuate. It's, I don't know who these individuals are. All I know is I can go into a map and put out a radius that would indicate that these are the locations and any numbers that are in that area would be notified. Okay, thank you. I, I mean, I, so, you know, that information wouldn't be available to you as like, you know, controlling what, as you send out messages, but I wonder if this data is somewhere, you know, in with Everbridge or something. Um, and I also had a question about, um, it, you would automatically, if you sign up for this um, through Weathers Field, it automatically would sign you up for CT alerts. And is there a way to opt out of that? Or is it just as once you're in, that, you know, because someone might say, oh, I'm interested in events, you know, going on in Weathersfield and um, but maybe don't well, want the UTLR state is strictly emergency. There is not broadcast for just information. It is strictly emergencies. Right. I guess I just my bigger concern is just the government having, <laughs> you know, tracking people not to sound like, well, I, I understand, right, oh. to have that information or to call for, you know, propaganda or whatever it is that they may be doing, but um, for that 
that that's not the case. Again, two one one handles and upgrade updates Everbridge with uh, landline information, uh, daycare centers uh, when they get certified, those numbers go in there. So this way, when there is an emergency, again, I, I'm not. I don't have access to names and specific addresses. We're just going in and we're, we're highlighting a street or we're highlighting a whole block or by miles and um, a Everbridge message will be there to dictate whether it's an emergency. And for the other part, the non-emergency, those are subscribers that would go in and opt to select what they want to hear from. And when they change their mind, it's all under their control. They remove that information and they dictate how they want to receive that information. Okay. Um, and, and one other thing um, about the cost. So this is a, like a three-year contract. Is this but I, presumably this is an ongoing cost, you know, that would just continue year after year because presumably it would get bigger and bigger as, you know, it takes a while for people to hear about it and to opt in. So, um, and so this is not just a, you know, a 30,000 or $32,000 cost. This is a, just another expense the town will have to incur annually. Yes. Thanks. And again, we would have to campaign to let people know that this service is here, you know, by putting it on our websites, the town websites, showing them where they can go to sign up to receive these information. Councilman Biggs. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, and just to piggyback off of where Mary went with the pricing part of it, because that was my question. Um, so when I when I look at the initial setup, um, it does show information saying that year one, the initial credit's 1.5 million. Um, so I'm assuming that once you surpass that, um, then you start getting charged for every additional, just like a, you know the old school text messaging situations and whatnot. Um, is there like a further analysis of what a potential cost would be moving forward with that? Because if you think about setting this up and you think about households and how many people have cell phones, I know it'll take us a while to get there. But um, if we're talking about 10,000 plus um, households, you can think about all the devices attached to those households and the messages that would go out eventually. I'm just kind of like looking at the, you know, we're here, but once we go up there, what does that look like? And, and I guess I'm kind of looking at the future of this. I think it's a great idea, but I just don't want to get in that old school trap of when you sign up for a cable company in the next year, it goes sky high three times. Yeah, Karen, I, I, I sort of forgot what, what the um, gentleman said about that. Wasn't there? Um, there is because they, it, it would be, you would, there would be an app and um, I will double check with that, but I don't think that anybody's ever hit anything like that, that they would be over, because there are towns that do utilize this currently, the uh, Mass Notification Pro, and nowhere have they hit anything that would be extended charges, but I will double check with that. Okay, thank you. I just, it's, I feel like it's one of those questions for us to be oh, sure. uh, concerned about, so uh, thank you very much. Mr. Deputy Mayor? Yeah, I wonder if uh, someone could explain to me what the current email notification system, I guess it is that the town uses. I obviously opted in at some point and I do get notifications of, uh, you know, a parking ban or uh, even a job posting, all kinds of information comes out uh, through Wellsfield Town Hall. and. How does that, what is the limitations of that, that we couldn't use that same system for these non-emergency items that you're discussing? That might be a Derek question, Derek Sola. He says, um, he's texted me. Uh, it's a free service, once a day emails. 
I don't know. Derek, if you're on, maybe you can just answer it. Yeah, I, I don't know this exactly, but I, I believe that it, Bonnie's correct. That's just something that the town has set up where they can just send one mass email out a day on a, a specific topic. Like you said, job postings, parking bans and stuff. But it, it it's not timely where where we would have access to a program where we can constantly update things or change the message. So I believe that's just sort of like a, I shouldn't say a junk mail, but a message that just goes out once a day when someone feeds the email into the system. But I see Derek's on now, so he can probably answer that better. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a very limited service. Um, it happens every day, I think around 4, 15. So we, we could explore other options for more timely emails, but it's really wasn't even the intended purpose. So it may not suit your needs for this case. And does somebody have to manually update it with information? Not like I could go in and add my name to it. It would be somebody maintaining it. You can automatically enroll in it. And then uh, it just takes a query of all the messages in the day and sends them out just once a day. It's very automated. We don't really have a lot of flexibility. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Derek. A uh, couple other things. So everybody that wants to get these messages has to opt in, correct? Yes. For the yes. non-emergency only. And it's is it strictly a cell phone or land, does it have you can put landline, you can put email, you can put cell phone. Yeah. You would have an app on your smartphone. One of my concerns about, you know, the emergency notification aspect of it, you know, we have, I'm sure there's plenty of seniors that have no idea how to opt in. And it's not a system where you can just geographically populate all those phone numbers. You have to have the person opt in. Is that Correct. Well, if, if, if you're talking about the elderly that may not, we'll say they don't have a cell phone and they have a landline, right. they're already in Connecticut alert because 211 puts in all the yellow and white pages into that. So when, okay. if I have an emergency that I hit, let's just say I put the, um, the area to be over on Prospect Street or let's say Executive Square and they all have landlines, they'll get the messages for emergencies because that's all in by landline. Now, I, again, I know I'm sure social services could assist those elderly that strictly have cell phones on how to opt in. Um, I'm sure their caregivers can also assist them, um, but this is to receive both the, this portion is strictly the non-emergency as well as helping the citizen to get into Connecticut Alert if they had not already done so. When you say it's not emergency, but it still is emergency, isn't it? I mean, isn't that your position, emergency management? It's like you you want to get an emergency notice out, don't you? Isn't that well, now they're not well, all yeah. emergency notices. The 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 COVID test kits was a prime example. It wasn't an emergency, but we needed to notify as many people as possible. There there can be you know, and again, large events, things like that to tell people where they're parking and, and whatnot. So that's all part of, of the package or the flexibility we would have. We used to have a very similar system when I was working in Missouri. So for example, there's a water main break and it's gonna affect, well, perfect what happened the other day, Silas Dean and all the businesses in Executive Square. Then this system, you can go in there and you could put a, a like a, a an arrow around the certain area you want to contact and you send it right out and you'd say this is town of Wethersfield we have a water main break it could last until nine o'clock tonight or whatever and then just zero in on those people who are affected by the water main break and you could communicate with them um, you know just that group like say every three hours saying okay they're working on it they found the pro you know what I'm saying but we and, used to use it quite a lot for not and, just emergency, but non-emergency. And that ends up helping public safety 
Because when something like that happens, they don't think to pick up their bill and look up the phone number for whether Eversource or MDC, they call into dispatch. Did you know what's going on? Let me know. So if we are ahead of the game and we're advising them as it's happening, less calls coming into the 911 center in regards to it, which will help out public safety. And uh, just one last question. Is there any opportunities to, to uh, use the emergency management funds that we get each year? For, I know it's primarily for offsetting our uh, salaries, but it also says it includes equipment. Is there any way we could, uh, I don't know if that's a fixed amount. I think it was like $14,000 last year. Is that something that we apply to so that we would say, well, now we have another 10,000 or would we be, have an opportunity to get a, a bigger chunk of money from, uh, no, I guess it's FEMA. That, that present grant that we get from the state is based on population. So that's why we, it's about 26,000 and change based on our population. And then we get, I believe we pay half of that or there's an offset that goes with it. But obviously if we did have something like that, we needed to offset it. There's always FEMA grants out there that we can apply for to see if we can get, get funding to offset some of this pricing if, if need be. So the state may also have have other grants available that we can look into. Yeah, but the, grant, you, the grant you're specifically talking about, that's a fixed price based on our population. Okay, yeah. Yeah, I'd be very interested in you exploring any opportunities to get grant funding because, you know, as uh, others have said, you know, this is something that once it's in place, it's going to go for essentially forever. And, you know, 10 grand is going to become 15 grand. And, 20 years from now, maybe it'll be 40 grand, so. Uh, oh yeah, no doubt. We, we, can, we can explore all those you know, avenues as far as getting, finding other funding from, from specific grants. And also the, some of the questions asked before, as far as getting people, getting it out there, we'll, we'll flood the market. I mean, we'll, 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 whatever we have to do to publicize this to get as many of our town residents exposed to this, we'll do that. We have to go to you know, the senior center to, to the schools or whatever. I mean, we, advertising, it's not going to be a problem. So I, I'm pretty confident if we do purchase it, we'll, we'll get it out there to everybody so we'll be able to take advantage of it. Because it's a waste. If, if we don't publicize and nobody opts into it, it's, it's a waste of money. Thank you. Any other questions for either Karen or Anthony? Councilwoman Pelletier. I just have one more question. I know we have a, a ARPA subcommittee that's um, looking at a lot of different departments have, you know, been going to them to present um, things that they would like the ARPA funds to be used for. And I was just curious why this isn't being presented to the ARPA subcommittee and it's coming straight to the council. It was presented, Mary, but there's a discount they're giving us that if, if there's not a decision by the end of December, then we would lose the 10% of December, February, then we would lose the 10% discount. So that's why we at least wanted to bring it to you because we're saving money um, if we do it now. But it did go through the committee. It's, is the committee um, gonna be like prioritizing and, and or just, I don't know how it's, working they because be. I, they haven't yet the only reason they brought this forward was because of the discount all right thanks mm -hmm. i just have a couple technical questions um you mentioned landlines and cell phones so is it a recorded message that would go across landlines Yes, we could and do. Then, we can do that where it's recorded as well. Yep. Would it would be you know town staff records it or is it uh, digitized? You type in the the message and you get an automated uh, voice recording. It has both. Okay, um, and then the alerts to cell phones. Would it be um, you same know, thing? If they opt for text or if they, if they want to pick it up and listen to it, they can either hear the person talking the message or digitalized. Right. Okay. Depending on who, what the sender does. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, it just brings back memories for me on snow days at 520 in the morning, my cell phone, my wife's cell phone, and then the home phone goes off. And that kind of defe defeats the purpose of a snow day at our house. Uh, everybody's up at 520. Um, but uh, no, I, I appreciate the uh, presentation. And, um, and also, you know, one thing I, I wanted to say about checks and balances is, um, you know, would this be something that I don't want to say abused, but I've heard from some residents on other towns, they've said, you know, oh, thank goodness you guys don't send out messages like my mayor or my first selectman do. They, they flood me with, you know, there's a sale at so-and-so's or uh, such and such bridge club is meeting on Tuesday night. Um, you know, please sign up. It's not intended for that. It's, you know, if, if there's a catastrophic problem for that bridge club meeting at the senior center or the community center, it would tell folks that there's a problem at the community center and there's, you know, please, uh, you know, um, check in with so and so to, you know, look at rearranged times or something like that. Yeah, and we, we, we'd have to, we'd have to write some policies on how it should be used, when it should be used to, to um, give out to the departments. And again, I agree with you, Mr. Mayor, if you flood, it's just like getting junk mail. If you get, you get flooded with messages every day, you stop paying attention to them. So it would have to be just beneficial information that's timely, that's needed. So, you know, multiple people need to know about it. So it's just, it would have to be, and again, I use the scenario like the pools, things like that, bad weather coming, you know, we're closing the pools for the day, things like that. So it just wouldn't be the advertised things or just sending messages for, uh, I would say feel good stuff, but not really important. Right. I'm glad to hear that there'd be some policies, maybe some checks and balances that if a message goes out, um, somebody from your team, the emergency management team, has a second set of eyes uh, from the town manager uh, or somebody just to review it. Um, and then also policies on, you know, not flooding the, uh, the um, inboxes or uh, right. text residents. No, it's good to know. Um, glad to hear that uh, there is a 10% discount on this. Obviously, you know, we have talked to you guys were part of the conversation on the budget. Budget constraints are always present year after year. Um, if there is a way to take advantage of any FEMA grants or state um, Department of Emergency Management grants, um, please do so. We will. Any other questions or comments for Karen or Anthony on this? Hearing none, is there a motion before us tonight? Can be. If not, uh, uh, Councilman Forrest, are you offering? Sure, I'll move it. I'll move to approve the three-year purchase of the Everbridge Emergency Mass Notification System <clears throat> utilizing ARPA funds in the following amounts. Year one, $11,013.67. Year two, $10,197.84. Year three, $10,197.84. Um, I'm sorry, there's just one amendment because of that 10% discount. Year one is 9,912 and 30 cents. I'm glad it didn't get seconded or we would be in trouble. Exactly, that's <laughs> I, why I jumped I, in. I would, uh, thank you, nice job, uh, town manager. And then I, uh, can you give me that number again, Bonnie? Yes, 991230. Um, I withdraw and amend that previous motion to change the year one total to $9,912.30. The rest I keep as stated. Second. Could, could we Discuss add to that? Would you like to add to that? Oh, you can amend. Could we add that it says we're gonna use ARPA funds. Can we add that we'll reassess it in year four? You always have that option. I mean, that's sort of a. It's a dome. Okay. Yeah. Like. Disregard my comment. <laughs> I, well, I agree with you, Tom, but I don't think, you, I don't know if you need a formal announcement. Fine. For that. Yeah. Now, would this have to go before us? I mean, we're still in discussion. So would this have to go before us or before the council in year four because of uh, an expenditure in 
It would just be a part of the budget. Fund, yeah. Okay. So we're, we're approving it using ARPA funds. In year four, four we won't have ARPA funds. That's so. why it'd be a part of the budget if it wants to get continued. I'm thinking to um, the, uh, Tom's comments uh, or the, earlier tonight about, you know, the spending, the taxes. I think this is just, I mean, it's not for emergency purposes. I think it's something that we don't need to add this expense. Um, just because we have all this ARPA money doesn't, you know, I feel like things are just coming out of the woodwork. Oh, we can use it on this. You can use it on this. And the money is going to be gone before we know it. I think that there's other better uses for the money. I also think that the system is ripe for abuse. Not that it would be now. I'm not thinking now or next year even, but five, 10 years down the road, we don't know who's going to be in charge of it. We don't, you know, it, we don't know, you know, that, and I'm not just, I have concerns about tracking, but I also have concerns, you know, you know, Mike, you mentioned, you know, this, just some frivolous things getting pushed out or even, you know, political things getting pushed out um, because different people will be in charge in the future. And we don't know if, you know, they might not have the same kind of ethics that, um, you know, are in place now with this group. And I, you know, obviously have the utmost respect for, you know, Karen and Anthony. So I'm not suggesting that, but I'm thinking into the future. Um, and so I just feel like on fiscal grounds and with my privacy concerns, I, I, I don't even think we need this, but just my two cents. If, if I can just say my, my bigger concern with this again is having the option for people to opt in to receive important information that they are not getting now and especially during what we saw through this pandemic and not only that you have a lot of um, events that happen in town people that are not residents that can opt in for a specific event only for a time period that we have a means to get that emergency information out to them to me is very important and viable. And that's where I'm looking at it for that point. There are things that we can put into place. There is also a um, university that they, it's an Everbridge University that they are gonna give training to for those that will be the ones um, handling this. Templates can be made and reviewed. Um, so that's just, that is my stance with that. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Nay. Ayes have it. Sue, did you get the tally? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Motion here. Excuse me as I go back to the agenda. This is the final one on, I believe, other business. Yes, uh, this is the continuation of the conversation we had uh, at the last meeting. Uh, it was an introduction uh, by Denise Bradley from our planning department. Um, this was a request of planning and zoning to get our um, temperature on marijuana establishments in town. There were some conversations that were had between um, the planning department as well as the chief of police and our assistant director of social and youth services. Um, before us tonight is the, um, I guess it's just, I don't believe we have to we have to make a vote on this. Uh, it's just giving guidance um, to it's, it's a, Yeah, It's giving guidance to them so that they know where the council's at. Okay. Uh, I will open it up for discussion with the council on some of the 
um, uh, information that was presented to us with um, um, the speakers at the last meeting. Um, you know, by way of background, I think you all know the state of Connecticut legalized uh, recreational use of cannabis last session went into effect on G uh, July 1 and some other uh, aspects of the law went into effect um, in the fall. Um, the state is ramping up uh, the licensing and the lottery for uh, would-be applicants for both retail establishments and um, cultivation right now. I think they've got lotteries in the future for um, uh, processing, transportation, and other um, aspects of the legalization and getting it to market here in the state of Connecticut. And P and Z, obviously, they're the ones in charge of who uh, and where uh, these um, types of facilities. Um, pretty much all, you know, facilities, not only those of cannabis. Uh, would be able to take establishment here in, uh, in Weathersfield. So um, I'll open up the floor for discussion on this and um, see if we can point PNZ in a direction where this council would like most likely um, have them go. Uh, Councilman Pentelow. Yeah, I think I made my, my position pretty clear uh, when we first discussed this after hearing from social services and the police department. I think the way that the bill is written uh, at this time, I don't really think it makes much sense to go forward with uh, recreational dispensaries, but there, there may be some ways to capitalize on some of the excess, ta excess tax revenue uh, by doing things like cultivation, um, transportation, or allowing for those sort of businesses. So um, I'd be in favor of kind of keeping in a moratorium uh, on recreational facilities while at the same time allowing for different cultivation. Um, that's just sort of my two cents. Um, I don't, I don't know the, the, how the rest of the council feels, but I'm sort of interested in hearing. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Deputy Mayor. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> I'll piggyback along with, uh, what Pat said, uh, I, uh, I'm opposed to the retail sale of, uh, cannabis in our town. I can't find any value that it really brings to the town. Uh, we've heard from our police chief and social services, uh, our health director, um, not a lot of good things uh, to say about it. Uh, I, I don't believe we are allowed to uh, create a moratorium on the retail sale forever. So I would opt to uh, prohibit retail sale and establish guidelines for the other um, uh, marijuana uh, cultivators, uh, processors, um, and all those other categories other than retail and uh, let planning and zoning uh, put their heads together and come up with the proper areas uh, in our town that we could have these type of businesses, um, you know, prohibiting it from close proximity to schools, churches, um, between each other. I don't know that Think we could only have one anyways but uh, put all those regulations in place and like I said prohibit the retail sale because I think that's you know I, I just don't want to be known as Wethersfield's place to go to to, to uh, buy your uh, cannabis um, I don't think it sends a good message to the youth that it's uh, that it's okay and it's good for you so uh, that's where I stand on that and there's there's going to be facilities close by uh, to Weathersfield. So if you choose to purchase some, you can go to Hartford, you can go to Newington, perhaps. I'm not sure exactly where each place will end up with the lottery, but you know, it's not like uh, it's going to be out of reach and, and create a big burden for those residents that uh, wish to purchase cannabis. So that's where I stand. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Any other counselors with comments tonight? Mayor, is this just for discussion purposes or are we actually gonna be putting something forward this evening? There's, there's a motion available. 
to vote on. Well, I, I guess I, so. I guess my question is: uh, I mean, will that be what we're doing? Will I have a motion to put forward and vote? I believe so. Uh, let's see. Yeah, I mean, you don't have to, but it might make more sense, especially if there's not agreement. You know what I mean? Yeah. Now this is P and Z is looking for some type of guidance. And I don't know if I saw Denise on earlier. Um, yes, I'm yep. here. Uh, planning and zoning is looking for some type of guidance <laughs> from council. So essentially, um, you know, we are looking to see whether council would rather us um, propose regulations that would prohibit retail sales or to um, go forward with uh, compiling regulations that could possibly um, include provisions to approve them in town. Okay, thank you. And then, you know, this body does not have the final say. Um, planning and zoning would have the say on what they would allow. I mean, this is just direction. Um, ultimately, the final vote is through that body, if I'm not mistaken. So, ultimately, yes. I mean, we would, if you were um, supportive of um, prohibiting the use, I would draft regulations that would prohibit the use and then the Planning and Zoning Commission would vote in favor or in opposition to that motion. Um, you would said the use or the sale? The retail use. Of the law that permits the retail? As opposed of to production cultivation. Okay. I, just to clarify, it's not retail use, but retail sale. That's correct. Yep. Cool. Mr. Deputy Mayor. Yeah, I think what they're looking for is, is a, a definitive direction that the council would like to, to have them work in that direction. Uh, I think we need to make a motion and vote on it. If the, if the motion fails, then they have their answer. It's like. Yeah, I just. Otherwise, otherwise, Denise is going to go back and say, well, there was, there was nine people there and a couple of them made comments and the others didn't make any comments. So we were nowhere further than we were a month ago. The language of the motion and the agenda is just, you know, we're voting to advise the planning and zoning commission to, you know, allow or prohibit. So it's, you know, it's not like we're voting on an ordinance. We're just, so yeah, it's just basically just, but yeah, like, like the deputy mayor says, they need to know if they have a majority of the council or not. And just for the record, I, I'm in agreement with Councillor Penelo and the deputy mayor on, um, prohibiting retail sales, but allowing, you know, the cultivation. So that's where I stand. And just, just to clarify, I don't, I don't, I, I don't forever, like, I don't want to make it seem like I forever want to ban or prohibit retail sales. I'm, I'm really against it right now, just because the cost seemed to, the cost seems to be the benefit, right? So, or vice versa, I, I might've messed that up, but, um, it doesn't mean that, you know, the state legislator can't change it in the future where all of a sudden it actually behooves the, the towns and the municipalities to start, you know, kind of incentivizing to them to have dispensary. So that was sort of my, my reason for keeping the moratorium um, for as long as it could go with, in anticipation for them potentially changing it. Right, and I think it's better for planning and zoning to do that than, I mean, because we could pass an ordinance banning it, 
And that would be, I think, maybe a little more difficult to overturn. But I feel like planning and zoning can change their regs, update their regs more easily if and when maybe the tax situation in particular changes because right now we can't do much with the tax money even if we were to allow it so it's just not worth it with the extra cost and not just financially but you know <laughs> all the other things that go along with having those kind of establishments okay. councilman biggs i saw your hand up earlier um i was so do so as we're talking about this and, and saying we would we rather go the cultivation route and, and we rather not do the retail so do we have even the proper um information as far as laid out of what we're able to do because even if we talk about not doing retail we talk about going the other route then there's other regulations we have to look at you know where where is this distribution or um this other aspect transport aspect you know where are we able to do this? Is there a definite location that we're, you know, allowed to do this where it can't be by this establishment or can't be in this neighborhood and, and whatnot? I just don't want us to get bottled up and be scared of the word marijuana. And it's, oh my gosh, this, this thing is, is, is so bad. Let's, let's stay away from it. And then we, we miss out on an opportunity. Um, I mean, if we're, if we're going to be real, you know, I mean, mar alcohol is just as bad. So Let's not just look at the name or, or the association, the sense, the, you know, the sensation of it and, and automatically just chop it out. I just want to make sure we're making decisions off of, you know, real knowledge that we have of what we're able and capable to do. I'm, I'm honestly not yes or no. I'm kind of in the middle just trying to get full details on what we can and should do. Tom, you just said, you know, can we think about different ways of how we can bring in stuff to, to, to the town? Um, I'm not saying this is the answer to all, but I'm saying this is one of the many small things that can have a larger effect. Well, this, if, correct me if I'm wrong, we would be limited to just one facility in town by our population. That's right. It's one recreation and I think one cultivator, Denise, was that it? Yes. That's yes, it. based on and that's what that's what was told okay um and, and then just just for your information uh, the planning and zoning when they approve the moratorium in november um it expires at the end of may um there is the ability to extend it for up to six months longer um but the maximum amount of time for a moratorium is one year so at latest, it can extend to November. That's right. Okay. Would they be able to do a, they can't continue another moratorium. They can't institute a one in they, November. Uh, no. Okay. Um, and then to answer some of Councilman Biggs' questions, I mean, I think a lot of those regulations that have to deal with either cultivator or transportation manufacturer, those, those regulations would have to come from planning and zoning as well. That's not from this body, correct? That's right. And if you were supportive of you know, a cultivation or producer, we could definitely look to other communities to see what their regulations are and present those to you. Councilman O'Connor. Yes, thank you, Mayor. So just to piggyback on some of the comments that were said here, I originally looked at this as, and, you know, in conjunction with what the deputy mayor said is I initially viewed this as a great way to add potential tax revenue to our coffers and was really gun ho about, well, you know, hey, if all the communities around us are going to be doing this, then we'd be foolish not to do it and we should take advantage of the tax dollars. However, my mind was changed when the police chief came in and talked about the additional cost that he <laughs> would incur as a result of us opening up a retail shop. And then 
when you start to actually look at where those tax dollars can even be spent, they're highly controlled and restricted that the benefit was no longer there. It actually was cost prohibitive for us to really do something like that. And, you know, my goal with that is I don't personally think people should smoke, but that's, you know, that's not my decision to make. The goal I looked at is, is this a way we can generate tax revenue? And it's not, I don't think the re, the end result meets um, the cost that's going to be incurred for us to even allow these. Then when I started to see the rules around the cultivators and how the cultivators are responsible for security and all of that, and yet there's still limitations on where we can spend the money, they bore the majority of the cost and we would still get revenue, which could be cost, you know, positive. And so I don't support the retail stores. I don't think it makes financial sense for us. And so that is where I stand on that. And I think we should, I mean, if we're only going to be allowed one anyways, I have no problem just saying we vote no against retail stores, period. And it's not like another council can't come in and undo that. And if the rules change down the road, you know, two, three years, five years down the road and package stores are suddenly allowed to sell that, well, then that's something the council at that time can take up. Thank you, Councilman. And I'm actually just reading in the attachments. Uh, there are six uses of that 3% municipal gross receipts tax on it, but it looks like the majority and people did talk at length during the debate process on the revenue to the state. I think the, the biggest part is the 6.35% sales tax, as well as um, investment by those applying and um, the cost of licensing, um, as well as um, taxes uh, that would go into the state's general fund. So not to confuse folks out there, there, there really doesn't seem to be a windfall tax for the municipalities as much as what the state is receiving. And then to Councilwoman Pelletier's point of the six um, specific items, you know, it, it is, um, you know, very limited in what the funds can be used for. Um, and then I also, you know, heard what the cost would be to the town from the chief last time. Um, so, you know, I, I think we should probably give direction to the um, Planning and Zoning Commission on which way this council is feeling. Um, there are other licenses that um, people can apply for. Those would be, as we've mentioned before in this conversation, cultivator, uh, delivery, um, hybrid retailer, which we do not have here that's uh, for already pre-existing medical marijuana facilities. Um, even though we do have, and this is something probably a question for P and Z, we do have, uh, I believe, a zoned uh, portion of town for medical dispensary. So I don't know if that hybrid retailer would be able to piggyback off of the town's um, medical uh, location. Um, food and beverage, product manufacturer, pro uh, product packager, and transporter. So there are various licenses um, that could be, you know, part of uh, a business here in, in Wethersfield. Um, but if I'm getting the sense from some, it's the retail um, dispensary that folks who talked have concerns about already, if I'm not mistaken. Mr. Deputy Mayor. Are you frozen or am I frozen? He might be yeah. playing. He might be playing a trick on you. No, <laughs> no it's pretty still. <laughs> <laughs> he's good. I don't know if he's back. Then. I can't wait till these new rules come in. We're getting a whole process for this moment right here. <laughs> exactly. Tom's playing this a mime. Where he says, "I've got a question about the taxes and spending that's going." I'm pretty on sure now. he's got three questions. I'm just taking. <laughs> Mayor, can I can I jump in here while he's sure. going to come back? Thanks. I've got um, I have four questions, a couple of which were posed last time, and I haven't 
uh, or I, maybe either I missed it or I just don't have guidance yet. The first is what is the expected revenue of a particular location? We talked about that last time. We talked about whether, you know, I, and I'm kind of with, I think, Councilman Biggs, I'm sort of 50-50 and I'm also kind of, kind of with Councilor O'Connor. In the beginning, I really like this, but, you know, want to get a full breadth of understanding what we're getting into before I, I don't know, cast a vote, made a decision, et cetera. So do we have an expected revenue, tax revenue? I know the percentage, but, you know, we're talking about 5,000, 50,000 more, other? I have, I think it'd be hard. You don't know how large the facility is going to be. I mean, Denise, did you ever find out like with Massachusetts or places that already have it? I can do that, yeah. No, but you no. haven't so far. No, I have not. But so, it really is going to depend on, you know, how big it is, what they're selling. I don't know. I don't know if you're ever going to get an exact answer, that's for sure. No, and, and I certainly wasn't asking for an exact answer, but Massachusetts has had these and you know, we would we could even sort of generally regulate its size, either requirements in largeness or smallness. I suppose you have a maximum minimum, um, but just sort of some revenue anticipation or guidance would be helpful. The second one is we talked a lot about the difference between retail and other, but I asked the question last time: Does the tax revenue apply to other facilities yes. than? Yes, that's what CCM responded. Okay, so if it's a distributor, it's the, those, when they sell their marijuana to retailers, we would get the three and whatever percent tax off yeah. of the total CCM growth. CCM is saying yes. Okay. So I suppose I'm, I'm now interested in what the revenue, anticipated revenue difference would be if there is any between a real, real retailer distributor, grower, these types of things. Okay. Large, large operation growing might be tremendous, right? Versus the other, or maybe not, a, I don't know. The answer is I don't know. Um, my next question is sort of hyper-technical, but is it federally legal to even enter this business? And I know that there's like kind of turning the other way on some of this stuff, but <laughs> I don't know legally that this is even I, I, I was talking to my banker the other day just for my business and they said like, we can't even get into this because it's not even federally allowed. Um, and so I'm certainly aware of the turning the other cheek and, and the rest of it, so there's a criminal aspect of the rest of it. And I know the states have authorized it, but have we gotten an opinion on whether this is federally allowed or are we halfway condoning an illegal activity or not? No, I, I don't know. The answer would be no, we have not researched that, but certainly they haven't clamped down on the other states. But I can try to find out it's if true. states' rights are going to um, supersede. And that I think that is sort of the ultimate question. I certainly don't know the answer. I'm not going to pretend like to know. Um, and the fourth one is, and I'm sort of interested from other counselors who've sort of talked about this. I, I'm not, in my mind, I'm equating this to alcohol. Uh, low level, but changer of mood, et cetera, right? And we certainly have alcohol establishments. So why would I think a marijuana establishment would be any better or worse than an alcohol establishment? And if somebody has a way to sort of differentiate the two, at least in my mind, I'm, I'm admittedly not differentiating them. And maybe I should be, but I'm not. And I would like to know if how people view alcohol dispensaries, which are package stores, uh, versus marijuana dispensaries, which are just selling marijuana, a low-level drug. I'm sort of equating to not much different as far as health or socio uh, consequences as alcohol. So I'm interested in any thoughts if anybody has them on this. I assumed you were. <laughs> uh, I have the floor, sorry. sir. Yes. Um, 
So, I, you know, my, my thought process was, was very similar to Councillor Forrest um, in that, uh, you know, I, was, I equated it with alcohol. You know, how does the town approach um, alcohol? I mean, I, as a, in Old Weathersfield, there's, there's yet, you know, we, we know of a brewery opening up on Main Street, yet, you know, P&Z doesn't come up to us every time we look to open up another uh, alcohol establishment in town. Um, so, you know, it's, in fact, I mean, if you look at this, I was doing some research and look at the alcohol is much worse for you than, than marijuana. It could, you know, there's, uh, there was almost a thousand deaths in Connecticut last year um, related to alcohol. I'm sure there were some in our community. Um, were there any in regards to marijuana? No, I, I, I'm assuming herb, they're probably not. Um, and my next point, I just kind of was regarding the chief's concern, which I, I, uh, I understand his concern, yet at the same time, the last couple of weeks, I have gone to New York City and in Massachusetts. And, you know, at the time, I think his, his uh, concerns in regard to traffic, um, well, at the time, the demand was for cannabis was through the roof. And there was limited supply, right? Because there's only a handful of places in this one state in our area. So yeah, the, the demand was through the roof. It caused traffic and so, some issues up there. I was in New York City last week. You, you could literally go up to a, a van on the side of the road, you know, like, like a and, and just get it there. There's, it's, it's ubiquitous. So I'm not saying that's the, the, the role we need to go, but my point is I think we need to be, we're open to everything or we're open to nothing. Because to say that, yeah, we can grow it, but you can't sell it, I, I don't, I, I, that doesn't reconcile with me because I'm not really concerned about the costs. So it's you, we either should be for it, you know, or, or against it. So, and that being said, you know, looking through some of the, uh, the, the data from Pullman and Comedy that they reconciled for us, it doesn't even seem as though that because we're kind of not, we haven't kind of jumped in already with uh, both feet here that we kind of have some time because they're going to be established. They're going to be sending out these licenses sooner rather than later for opening up the lottery, so to speak for all for the nine different licenses. So I feel as though maybe Bonnie, I don't know if or anybody else here knows that we're kind of almost like too late because we haven't, gone in um, with both feet uh, with in regards to any of these licenses. So perhaps we do wait for some other communities in Connecticut to open up, get these um, licenses and kind of see what their experiences are like before we go in for any, uh, whether you're a cultivator, a retailer or a transporter, you know, let, let them kind of jump in first and then see where we are from there. I had two phone calls, I don't know about Denise, inquiring about where we're at. Denise, have you any? Yes, I've, I've had several. I've had about three inquiries about specific properties for retail. Okay, um, and I, the only, this expires in end of May the moratorium? Yes. So, and I think P and Z is, is, I mean, I think they're looking at this, the first of the retail licenses went out early February, they have 90 days. So early May, we will start to see the lottery recipients of the um, retail establishments. But then, you know, shortly thereafter, our moratorium expires. So I don't think there will be enough time to test the waters to see what other towns are doing before our moratorium expires. Um, you know, I would like to give some guidance, uh, you know, from the town. I mean, it's strictly guidance from us. The planning and zoning has their own opinion. Uh, of what to do after, you know, we get anything. So um, I don't know if Deputy Mayor is back or not, but 
his concern was to provide some type of um, direction for them to take. And I think I heard that through other councilmen on this call as well. Councilman O'Connor. Yeah, two things, Mayor. First, I just wanna make a comment and then I'd like to make a motion. The first comment is um, I want people to look at this from the optics perspective. And, you know, not too long ago, a child at Silasteen Middle School was rushed to the hospital because they ate a bunch of gummies that I think they had taken from one of their brothers, uh, older brother's supply at home. And the child ate like he ate gummies like any kid would eat and probably ate about a dozen of them and had to be rushed to the hospital. From an optics perspective, if I'm a parent and I'm coming in saying, how in God's name did this kid get access to these gummies? And he said, well, it's easy. They just went down the road and got it at the store. You know, I just, I'm sorry, I'm not comfortable with that. And because there's no financial incentive or gain for the town to even have it here, it just doesn't make any sense to me. So I'd like to make a motion to advise Weathersfield Planning and Zoning Commission to allow for the cultivate for the cult, and I don't know how to word this correctly, so I'm very open to it. The cultivation of marijuana, but not the retail sale uh, of marijuana in the town of Weathersfield. Second. Motion has been made and seconded. Discussion? Councilman Hill. Councilman Hill. Thanks, Mayor. Uh, so, so, uh, so we're all, so the town is now in, under this motion. We will be saying that we are okay with growing as much of it as you want, but you you, you have to go to a neighboring community to purchase it. Well, that's, that's not how it works because you have to, first off, qualify to do it. You have to provide security. It's not like someone's growing this at home and we can only have one cultivation center, if you want to call it that. And so I, was, I am much more comfortable with the cultivation of it where the, the, the cost is on the cultivator instead of the town to manage and support that. So it's not like there's so, going to be multiple cultivators. What, what costs would, would, would the town incur that we would no longer have to incur? Well, if we go retail, there's significant costs. The police chief came in and shared all of those. But if well, they go- His concern was, was, was traffic. Well, it was a lot more than that though. He had numerous concerns. He had traffic, he had security, he had um, increased training for police officers. And so he listed off a whole bunch of them. And, you know, it, to me is when I started doing the math on that, it just didn't financially make sense. And when you look at the cultivation piece, to me, it's almost like a no brainer because the cost is all going to be bore by the person who's cultivating it or the company or the organization not us we don't have to provide security and that's why i just looked at that as a better financial decision so i think i think what the chief was referring to it's not like the chief has got a has to have a private security detail outside of one of these establishments at all times i think i think the training thing is an issue but at the same time he has to do that anyway this is the law of the land in the state of connecticut whether it's in weathersfield or not so and, and I, I understand where you're coming from, Councillor. So I guess my, my thing is we're, we should be either for all nine or zero of the nine um, in this respect, because I just feel like it's a little hypocritical that you can grow as much as you want, you can transport it, you could be a hybrid retailer, you know, you could be a product packer, you can do all these things, but you can't sell it here. You've got to go to our neighbor, neighboring community to get it. I just, I just can't reconcile that in my head. And just to jump on to what Councilman O'Connor did say, you actually can, individuals can grow starting July 1 of next year. So there is the option that, uh, um, you know, if you don't want to purchase it yourself and go to a retail, um, you know, individuals can grow this on their own 
um, starting next year. Uh, that is an option out there. So any further discussion on this? Councilman Forrest? I just don't think I'm ready to vote yay or nay without some of that basic information we talked about, including the legality of the whole situation. If you guys want to vote this right now, obviously you're going to have the votes, so you're going to have the vote, but I'll probably be abstaining because I'm just not at a point to be able to give advice since I need a little bit of those key factors that we talked about, including revenue. Oh, I just, I, I don't know if Tom made it back on the call. Just to point that out before we vote. <laughs> this will be a perfect time for that section G. <laughs> In the interest of no, fairness, I'm happy to wait if you need to. I don't see him. Councilman Biggs, do you have a discussion? I was just going to ask the question. Um, if we decided to keep the moratorium, what would that what would that do for this this whole aspect? That would just extend it to November or to their next. Uh, the moratorium um, expires right now at the end of May. It can't be extended unless uh, that's actually formally proposed and approved by the Planning and Zoning Commission. Roger. Got it. Thank you so much. Bonnie, did you? Uh take down Councilman O'Connor's motion? Sue, you must have it, right? I didn't write it down. Sue, you're here. Yes. <clears throat> I, I can repeat it. it was my, my motion was to advise yes. Weatherfield Planning and Zoning Commission of the Town, of the town Council decision to allow for the cultivation of marijuana business establishments uh, but not to allow retail. Uh, it's been made and seconded. Any further discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Nay. Abstention? Abstain. Okay. That's so do you need a roll call vote? Um, I think I have five, one, and one. Is that weak? Five, one, and one. I believe so. Okay. Thank okay. And one absent. Thank you, everyone. And then get back to the agenda. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Denise. Who were the five on that one? Councilman Pel, uh, Pel, Pentelo, Councilman Peltier, Councilman Rell, O'Connor, and Councilman Biggs. Thank you. Uh, moving on to Item 4A, this is the award of the sidewalk contract. And this was before us because I don't believe the current bidder, um, our current contractor bid on this. And we have, I think Derek, yep, Derek's on. Um, we've done this in the past, this is our um, sidewalk con construction and repair contract. These are the folks that uh, go around to homeowners that have cracked or um, misplaced slabs of sidewalk as well as curbing and uh, handicap accessible um, cuts, if I'm not mistaken, Derek. Are these the folks that do that? Yeah, I, I could jump in here. Um, all right, so yeah, this is, our, this is our sidewalk contract, the one that works for the town. Um, generally, they're responsible uh, for repairing sidewalks along, along town properties, um, along private properties where town trees have caused um, st structural issues, um, sidewalk ramps where we're going to be paving roads per ADA and Department of Justice requirements, 
Um, and then different areas that may have been brought to our attention by, um, we meet with the advisory committee for people with disabilities. Um, they do, this contract they did offer, um, or we did require them to offer the same unit prices that the town is paying to, to the residents that may need to do repairs along their property furnitures as well. Um, the last contract we had was a two-year contract expired in December, so we, we rebid it this year. Um, we did reduce it to a one-year contract, and the reason for going to a one-year really was we were looking at um, trying to do it a little differently. The last three contracts have been uh, a year and a half to two-year contract, so we were limiting the contract value to less than $100,000. Um, therefore, the prevailing wages um, wouldn't apply, and we would have thought we can get a little bit better pricing on it, as well as maybe open it up to other um, companies that may not have um, bid on it previously. So we had put out the bid with estimated quantities. Um, as you see in the results, we ended up with five bidders. Um, we estimated the cost of the work we had put out there is about $90,000. Um, DMP Mariah's construction on a Ludlow Mass was the low bid at $66,875. This work has historically been funded through our operating budget as well as a CIP account. Um, so I'm requesting award of the contract to DMP Mariah's construction and um, allow us to issue POs totaling $60,000 to get them started on the contract this spring. So if anyone has questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Anyone, any questions for Derek on this? Um, well, I will start it off. Um, it looks like, I mean, these, the bids came in pretty, pretty close, except for one. What, how did Nunez, Connecticut of Bloomfield, how did they get it so far off? What was their discrepancy? Yeah, I'm not sure why they came in so high. I mean, they, they were our contractor um, maybe about three contracts ago, so they have done the project before. Um, you know, one thing I'll say is that it's a difficult contract because it's a spot repair. They're not large areas of sidewalk. I mean, we do try to group the work um, with as much quantity as we can in the same area of town when we have them come in. Um, it is difficult for them to make money on it. So, you know, it's possible they just knew the type of job it was and, and bid it high. Um, I didn't, you know, I didn't ask specifically or dig too deep into those numbers. Um, as you mentioned, the low four bidders were all, you know, reasonably uh, close in pricing. Uh, we did do reference checks on this company out of Ludlow. Um, they do similar work for the city of West Hartford. They've been working uh, for the town of Manchester the last few years doing very similar types of programs. So um, the references came back good. You know, we really didn't have any reason, um, you know, not to recommend a ward to them. They are out of state, but they do a lot of work down in this area, Connecticut. Um, so we're, you know, we're anxious to get started and willing to work with them. We did build into this contract um, some caveats that if they are not completing the work within a certain amount of time, um, that we do have the right to award work to the second low bidder if they're not being responsive. Um, we have had some problems with that usually in year two of the two-year contract. So this is only a one-year contract. And um, you know, unless there's um, some agreement between us and the council and the contractor to extend it, you know, we'll plan on bidding it again next winter. Okay. And you said we only did this for the one year to keep it less than a hundred thousand dollars. Yeah, we typically spend somewhere between eighty, seventy, eighty, ninety thousand dollars a year, depending on the year. Um, so the last couple of years, it was a contract that was put out for for double that amount, um, which then kicks in prevailing wages, um, which can tend to drive up the cost. So given the issues we've had with some of our contractors being as responsive the second year. Um, as well as potential of maybe getting some lower bidding prices if we did it on a one-year basis. That's why we put it out to bid that way. Mm -hmm. And the limits on prevailing wage for projects like this is $100,000? Correct. Wow. What is it for construction? A million? 
depends on the type of projects. Um, I, I think building projects have a different threshold um, than they do for this type of work. So generally construction, right away construction, um, site work, things of that nature are a hundred thousand dollar threshold. Wow. It's probably been that way for 25 years. It was like that when I was here. We fought it and fought it and fought it, never won. And that was 50 years? Yeah. And, and the state doesn't abide by it. That's what kills me. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Any questions for Derek on this uh, contract? Hearing none, can I get a motion from anybody? If not, I'll make a motion to award the 2022 sidewalk construction and repair contract to DNP Morris Construction Inc. of Ludlow, uh, from Ludlow, Massachusetts, as per the town bid RFP number 08-2022. Uh, second. Motion's been made and seconded. Discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Ayes have it. Motion carries. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Derek. Have a good night. Thanks, Derek. Me too. Um, that is it for bids. Uh, no ordinance resolutions or appointments for introduction tonight. We do have minutes from the special meeting, uh, which we were in executive session on February 7th and then workshop meeting uh, from February 7th. Can I get a motion to approve those? Uh, I guess I can do it all in one. Can I get a motion to approve the special meeting minutes of February 7th and workshop meeting minutes of February 7th? So moved. Second. Motion's been made and seconded. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Ayes aye. have it. Mike, I have to abstain. Yep. You got that, Sue. And then um, do we have, I think we do have Mr. Young still on for uh, final public hearing or public comment section. And if Mr. Young, if you can hit star six, unmute yourself and let us know your name and address. Mr. Young, if you can hear us. Okay. Well, we'll give him some time oh. okay uh robert young 20 copper mill road um a lot of talk tonight uh this everbridge system that you were talking about earlier that you voted on uh it, it makes me think of uh when sally the uh director of physical services comes in and says oh i need a truck or i need this or i need that and we have a great deal and we got to have a decision tonight. Same thing happened. To and, you know, I, I wondered, I wondered while I'm sitting here listening to all of your great discussions, but I, I thought the town school system had an alert system also. And I don't know if it's an emergency because you're, you're notifying parents. You're a parent mayor. Uh, you must get those notices. Are those called emergencies or are those called just non-emergencies? You probably get both. Why didn't, why didn't we talk about that and utilize that system if possible? I don't know what that system is called. All I know is they have one and they use it for advertising things as well as telling the, the parents of students the school is closed or running late to picking up the, the youngsters or whatever case. Um, so I don't know why we weren't tonight talking about that either. Um, next subject. 
talking about marijuana. And the idea of will you have, do you want to have a local retail operation? Do you want to have a cultivation kind of an operation? Do you want to have a warehouse type operation? And first of all, you've got 169 towns in the entire state of Connecticut. So everybody's going to have something. Or you think everybody's going to have something. And there might be some that don't. But here's the thought. 150 towns are going to go for selling retail. Um, you're only going to get a handful of cultivators. Why? Because one, this is not a climate. This is not a climate that you grow year-round. Um, the, the plant has to grow in, in the good season, and then in the winter season, it doesn't grow. So I don't know how you're going to have the supply that you're going to need. Okay, And I think with that limitation, a cultivator is going to have a problem doing cultivation. You're only going to have the growing season. The winter season is going to be dead, nothing happening. Unless, unless he goes out and, and who has land in Weathersfield to be a cultivator? Let's think about that. You got, the, you got land down on the meadows. To do a cultivation a year round, he's going to have to put up greenhouses. He's going to have to put up greenhouses so they will be able to utilize the land during the cold winter season. And he's going to have to heat those big greenhouses. He's going to have to get them approved also. Can you imagine seeing big greenhouses as you're heading towards the Glaston, Glastonbury Bridge on Maple Street or whatever that street is called and you see nothing but big greenhouses? I don't think any, I don't think the planning and zoning will approve that. Okay? I, I, I mean, a, a guy that's going to go into cultivation, he's got to go 20, he's got to go 12 months a year kind of a thing. You can't go just the five months that we have for growing season. So I only see you having a warehouse. And I see a warehouse at a place such as the Foodways, kind of factory that we have on the Silas Dean Highway. Can you imagine seeing that big factory? I tear it down and put up a nice big factory with the, with the, with, with, with the leaves of the marijuana plants hanging on the side of the building. That would be nice. But think about this, Mayor. There'd only be three to five warehouses in the state of Connecticut. That's it. Not every town can have one. Uh, most of them are going to say we want to have retail. So you're only going to see anywhere from three to five warehouses in the state of Connecticut. And we have a lousy growing season, but we have a, a good growing season. But our season for the, for the cultivator is only five months long. That's going to disturb the whole operation, which means they're going to have to import. You're going to see 18 wheelers pulling in from who knows where, Mexico. That's where the growing places are. That's where they can grow year round. And, 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 our, and, and the warehouse is going to be chuck full, okay? And the warehouse is going to be distributing to all those other 150 towns, those three warehouses in the state of Connecticut, will be distributing to the three towns across the state. And they're going to make the most money. They're going to make the most money because they're going to be dealing in high volume. They're going to get whatever that percent is. So if you, if you think about you've got to get into something, the warehouse business is the, really the way to go. Cultivation is out, and, and you've already said you don't want to retail because of all the problems and all the, the cost that's involved. So I, I, would, I, would, I would zero in on warehousing. And you got only a couple spots on the Silas Dean Highway that you can put a warehouse on. Okay, Otherwise, I don't know yeah. where you're going to put it. Okay, I'm done. Okay, yep. well, listen, uh, I wanted to talk no, a little not. more about some other issues, but thank you very much, Mayor. You got it. Okay, thank you. Uh, seeing no more uh, callers, uh, can I get a motion to go into executive session to discuss uh, union negotiations? So moved. Second. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 
two of us. That's the majority. All those, uh, anybody know? Nay? Ayes have it, we're in executive session. All right, I just gotta wait for 